All right. So Councilmember Henson is out tonight. I believe Councilmember Unrein is online. Tony, can you hear us okay? He's not online yet. He might log on here in any second. Let me know when he pops up and we'll have him speak so he can hear us. Thank you. All right. Any questions about the agenda? All right. Any updates, Brett? Uh, just two quick items as it relate to the look ahead. So as you recall, last week, we had the parks, recs, fees, and charges that were pulled off from the agenda. I wasn't going to schedule these for discussion um, in the near term. We'll just bring them back as part of the kind of the budget process timing, just because most of them relate to going to implementation on January 1st or when the community center opens, which is uh, November of this year anyway. So plenty of time to discuss it. We might as well discuss it through the budget process um, timeline anyway. And then the other item I wanted to mention is the Thornton Water Project team. So the team that got the approval in Larimer County, um, we were able to pick a date of June 25th that we'll bring forward for the recognition by council for what they did. So you'll see that on the lookout as well. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Tammy? Nothing for me tonight. Thanks. All right. We will jump into briefings. First one is the development code update. Yeah. Good evening, Eric Council. Um, we're not trying to wear you into submission, <laughs> but this is a, a huge undertaking. And the goal of coming back to you periodically is so that you can consume this a bit at a time. And that at the end of the project, you won't have one huge document that you're not familiar with. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Karen Wadomsky to, in, to introduce the team. She has done a masterful job of coordinating this project. Thanks, Randy. So again, I'm Karen Wadomsky, and good evening, everybody. Long Range Planning Manager. I'm joined tonight by Lori Height, Senior Planner for the City, and then our consultant for the Development Code, Jackie Berg, is here. She works with the firm Housing TV. I'm not sure about um, dancing slides. Is this... I'll get this right one of these times. Okay, so uh, we are here tonight to talk about draft uh, chapter 18 articles three and four. They are the first draft articles for this development code update. Um, if you recall, we came to you last month in April to give a background education on zoning to prepare you for tonight's discussion and also got councils to direct direction on some of the high level policy decisions that we needed to make to uh, come to finalization, not quite finalization, but at least wrap up the draft, the first article of the draft. So um, tonight we're gonna go through a, a pretty long overview as Randy had indicated. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about our outreach summary and then we've split this presentation up by the types of zoning districts. So uh, Jackie's gonna run through most of the presentation. She'll talk through legacy districts, residential districts, mixed use districts and the non-residential districts that include commercial and employment. We'll talk a little bit about planned development districts and then some other districts that really don't have changes. But just to be comprehensive, we want to make sure that you see all the districts that are in the code. Um, so for this current phase of the project, we have done some public engagement already. Uh, we've met with the Planning Commission. We also met with BTAC to talk with them. And uh, we've also had two public open houses. We had one last Monday and we had one today actually probably had about 60 people attending overall. Uh, everybody was pretty supportive. We still are collating the comments, so we don't have complete comments to give tonight. And then in terms of the development community, uh, we've continued to do some stakeholder interviews. We are still looking at doing more of those. And then we will make sure that we give the draft articles to everybody to review and provide comments on. And so with that, um, we're gonna just jump right into it and uh, start talking about our post three and four. I'm sorry, I, my voice is really hoarse tonight, but I'm going to turn over to Jackie, so. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for having me here again this evening. Very excited to introduce the first couple of articles for the draft development code. Uh, so before we go into the proposed changes to all of the districts, I want to give some general proposed changes that really impact 
all of the districts in general. So um, I think the primary drive and the thing that's most important to keep in mind with all of these proposed changes um, is that they are um, being considered to further align your development code with the comprehensive plan. Uh, so a lot of the changes that are being considered are because uh, what's required or allowed in the zoning code today really isn't uh, the vision that the community has for the future um, as uh, it's depicted in the comprehensive the Thornton tomorrow together comprehensive plan so we really want to make sure that this uh, development code is a really useful tool for plan implementation uh, so the majority of the recommendations for change are to make sure that that happens uh, so some general changes that are being proposed um, the districts, many of them are being renamed, again, to better align with the future land use categories. However, we are not proposing that any property be rezoned at this time. Um, there are um, some new districts and changes to districts, but the map itself would not change. Um, so there are... Uh, uh, Councilmember Unrein, I think, has joined us. Tony, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. Great. Whenever you want to speak, just raise your hand and then the clerk will let me know you want to speak. Sorry. No, no problem. Um, there are also proposed changes to allowed uses. So we are taking a look at the current uh, limited uses that are within the code. Um, and determining whether or not that's a distinction uh, that's uh, worth carrying forward. We certainly want to look into how to better streamline um, approvals uh, here in the city and uh, eliminating the limited uses may be one of those ways uh, that we can do that. Uh, we're also with the specific uses, proposing to rename those to special uses. Uh, special uses is a much more commonly uh, used term. Uh, so it's uh, just one of those things to make the code a bit more user-friendly for folks. All right, so first we're gonna get into the legacy districts. Um, so the legacy districts are coming about because there are many districts um, within the zoning code today that uh, really do not align with the future land use categories of the comprehensive plan. Um, so these are um, districts that have um, existing development, uh, but they uh, really don't envision that type of development um, here in Thornton in the future. Uh, so the idea with the uh, legacy districts is uh, the properties currently zoned within these districts will continue to uh, be allowed to uh, you know, do their thing. They would not be considered non-conforming, but no new land area or property within the city would be able to be rezoned into these districts in the future. Uh, so there are a couple of proposed changes to the single family detached legacy district and the plan development legacy district that we'll go into a bit later in the presentation. But for our other legacy districts, there are no proposed changes. So these would just be carrying forward those existing allowances, but not allowing any future area or additional area in the city to be rezoned in the future. So getting into our residential zoning districts, um, this is just a list of all of the residential districts um, that are proposed uh, to be either created or carried over um, here in Thornton. So first, the uh, residential estate, no proposed uh, changes here. Same thing with the manufactured home legacy district. Um, besides becoming a legacy district, no proposed changes. And then for our other four districts, we're gonna go into a bit more detail because uh, there are some more major proposed changes that we would like to get your feedback on. So starting off with the single family detached legacy district. Um, so this will continue to be a single family detached only district, really meaning to uh, preserve and protect your existing single family detached districts, uh, but ensuring that any future neighborhoods, future subdivisions have more of a mix of housing like the comprehensive plan calls for. So um, even though this is a legacy district, we are proposing um, some minor changes to setbacks as Karen had um, let you all know about um, during your meeting in April. Uh, so currently there really are sort of two sets of standards uh, for the single family detached district, uh, depending on whether uh, you were approved uh, before or after 1996. So what we're proposing is really just to clean up those standards, make them more consistent across the board, um, and one thing to point out, um, during the April meetings, there was a proposal for a 10-foot rear yard setback based on your input. Uh, we're proposing that that be at that 15-foot um, meeting in the middle like you all have suggested. 
And then for um, ADUs, there are some proposed changes that would impact the single family detached legacy district and all the other um, districts uh, where ADUs are allowed. Uh, these changes do stem from state legislation that was just recently passed. Um, so there is a, uh, we are no longer able to uh, have a maximum for the size, um, whether that's a square footage limitation or a uh, percent of the principal <laughs> residence. So those will need to be eliminated. Um, we are also proposing that ADUs be allowed for use as a home occupation. That's not something that's required by the state, but it is something that we think uh, would just be a, a good thing to add into the code. So next we have the residential low density district. So this is a new district that's proposed really to take the place of the single family detached legacy district for new development. So this would really be a low density neighborhood, uh, but would provide more of a mix of housing types than what the single family detached neighborhoods would include. Uh, so this is not proposed to be included on the zoning map today. It's just a tool uh, in Thornton's toolbox, something that developers or property owners could come forward and request a rezoning to if it's in alignment with the comprehensive plan. So in this district, the primary uses would be a single family detached, duplexes and accessory dwelling units. Uh, some of the changes that are being considered are smaller minimum lot sizes. This will, um, it's proposed to be distinguished between an alley loaded or a front loaded home, recognizing that um, in order to get a driveway on your property and have good garage access, you would need a, dry, a wider lot, excuse me, than if you have a um, an alley and your garage is access to the rear where you could accommodate a narrower lot. Um, we're also proposing that um, some non-residential uses be allowed in the district as well, things that would really be uh, supportive of a neighborhood environment. So things like a cultural facility or a civic meeting facility other types of uses as well, um, like accessory commercial use uh, units would be allowed as limited or as a special use. Um, so again, increasing the types of allowances within these residential districts, but in a way that really ensures that the residential character of the neighborhoods would be maintained. Next, we have the residential mid-density district. So this is the um, new name for your single family attached district that you have today. Uh, it's meant to align with the um, medium density um, land use category in the comprehensive plan. Uh, so for new development, we want to make sure that it's really thoughtfully integrated all of the different residential housing types, um, along with any non-residential uses be really well planned and connected to one another. Also want to make sure new neighborhoods are more walkable. And then if any infill development were to occur, we want to make sure that they are really context sensitive and complementary of the surrounding neighborhood. So primary use wise in the um, medium density district, we're looking at single family detached homes, accessory dwelling units, um, duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, and townhomes. This is really where we get into our missing middle housing types and have a much uh, wider variety of uh, dwellings that are <clears throat> So some major proposed changes. So today in the single family attached district, uh, duplexes are allowed um, by special use. We are proposing that duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes um, and townhomes be allowed by right. We are proposing some supplemental standards to ensure that they um, have a really high design quality and really fit well into the neighborhood and transition into surrounding neighborhoods. I uh, want to allow those by right with a little bit less process than is required today. We're also proposing that for development over five acres in total area, that at least two types of housing be provided. Um, so this is really um, a direct tie to the comprehensive plan where uh, neighborhoods with a mix of housing types is really desirable. Um, we also wanted to keep it just at the two distinct types of housing and not increase it to more than that uh, because we have heard um, through our developer interviews that it is uh, quite difficult uh, depending on the site um, to get uh, necessarily more than two types of housing. So we wanna be um, responsive to the developers and also um, align with the comprehensive plan. Uh, so our recommendation is to have that at at least two. 
Um, and then similarly, um, we have uh, supplemental standards that really just help ensure um, that any infill development is really context sensitive and that it transitions well uh, to any surrounding uh, lower density development. Next, we have the residential high density district. This is the uh, renamed version of your multifamily district. Uh, so this district is meant to accommodate much uh, higher density neighborhoods, uh, but really expand the types of housing that are allowed um, or accommodated, um, especially near your uh, commercial uses. So currently that multifamily district really only accommodates pretty large scale multifamily buildings and complexes. Um, so we're really, looking to kind of expand that, enhance the district to allow for a bit more um, housing as well. Again, for new development, we want it to be much more walkable and connected to its surroundings. And then anything um, infill development wise just needs to be really context sensitive. For allowed uses, um, the um, all of the dwelling types that are allowed in the other um, Lower density districts would be allowed with the exception of single family detached, that really lower density housing type we're proposing uh, to not be allowed in areas where we would like to accommodate higher density housing, really preserve lower density for those appropriate areas and higher density uh, for those appropriate areas. Um, some other additional uses that are being proposed would be um, residential above the ground floor and live work units. So some other major proposed changes uh, would be <clears throat> requiring on uh, sites, again, over five acres in area, that more uh, than at least two distinct housing types, um, and then allowing for uh, those other non-residential uses um, more broadly. So we have um, in the uh, lower density residential districts, things like cultural facilities, institutional uses, while in the RH, we're also bringing in uh, lower impact commercial uses. So um, these would be maybe a, a coffee shop or a, a corner store, something that residents um, of the multifamily would be able to access easily, trying to create more of a mixed use environment. This would not be a requirement, but it would be an option that's available. <clears throat> Any questions about the residential districts before we move it to the mixed use districts? Justin? Well, I've got, I have a couple questions. Uh, my first question would go back to the residential medium <laughs> district map. to see it there, but I've got it here on my. Computer, I've noticed that you have proposed making residential medium the area that includes the RTD bus station on 88th and uh, 25, and also the North Star School. But those, you know, those are residential. So, what's um, what would what was the intention there? That Sure. So the um, RM district, what's here on the map, is what is today the single family attached district. So there are circumstances where there are non residential uses in the residential districts. So things like schools uh, would be allowed uh, within these districts and they will continue to be allowed. Um, so that is where some of those got captured because they're currently in your single family attached zoning district. So that, that area is already single family attached. Correct. Yeah. Yep. And then my next question was about um, you mentioned the home occupation mm -hmm. and ADUs. What what is that? What's home occupation? Sure. So a home occupation, um, it would be um, someone who's working out of their home. Not um, like so. I, I have an allowance to work hybrid, right? So I'm working partway in an office, partway at home. It's not so much what a home occupation is, but if I were running my business out of my home, like my the address of my business was the address of my residence, that would be considered a home occupation. So we have standards that would limit the number of employees that you would be able to have, um, that you, um, how you could see customers or clients, that type of thing to really limit um, home occupations to make sure they're not a nuisance to neighbors. And I also just wanted to clarify for home occupation, our code currently allows that. So, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
Yep. Any other questions? Advance a little bit here. Okay, so moving into our mixed use districts. Uh, we have two mixed use districts that we are proposing to carry forward. Uh, so mixed use and the transit oriented development. Uh, we are proposing some changes to these districts really to streamline uh, the standards. They're a bit complicating today, um, but we want to just make them a bit more streamlined so they're easier to understand and to utilize. Um, so neither of these districts are currently used, so they're not included on the map. Um, and it could be because the standards are a bit complicated. So we're hoping that by streamlining them, uh, we will um, encourage uh, their use in the future. Um, so again, these are not going to be applied to the map. They're just going to remain available um, within the code for a, a future uh, rezoning of the school. All right, so next we have our commercial and employment districts. Um, so we are seeing a bit of change uh, with all of the commercial and employment zoning districts. So we'll go through all of these in a bit more detail. Um, so starting with the neighborhood commercial district, this is currently the neighborhood services district. So uh, renaming it to neighborhood commercial really just to uh, more broadly apply to all of the use types that could be allowed uh, within this district. Um, but the purpose of it is really uh, the same. It's meant to accommodate small scale non-residential development uh, within proximity. Um, of our residential neighborhood. So we want to make sure that um, people have convenient access to goods and services, but we also wanna make sure um, that those goods and services don't become a nuisance in their backyard. Um, some new development, we would like to be more human scaled, compact, pedestrian oriented, and really well connected uh, to surrounding development and also include some public gathering space so that there are more uh, third places throughout the community where people can uh, come together and, and build community. In terms of allowed uses, um, the primary uses would be small scale businesses really trying to control impact by controlling the size. Uh, so less than 3,500 square feet, uh, retail, office, restaurants, et cetera. Uh, there are some low impact businesses that would also be allowed without any size restriction. Uh, so banks, medical clinics, and personal services. Mm -hmm or some new uses that are proposed to be allowed as well, um, including artisan manufacturing. This would be really small scale production, often um, like a someone who works with leather to make uh, purses or a small scale chocolate manufacturer. Um, so they do small scale manufacturing and also have a retail component on site. Um, and we're also proposing some additional uses be allowed uh, with a special use permit. Uh, this would introduce some residential uh, within this district, so live work units, as well as residential above the ground floor. Some other uh, major changes that are being proposed, I think one of the biggest ones um, is uh, we're proposing that drive throughs no longer be allowed. Uh, this is probably uh, one of the um, pieces of input that we heard from the public, the loudest and the clearest. Uh, there was no uh, desire for new drive throughs especially in proximity to residential neighborhoods. Uh, so that's where this proposal um, uh, for change is coming from. We're also proposing some uh, new site orientation standards to make sure that new development is much more pedestrian oriented, um, really is more vibrant with additional uh, patio dining um, and making sure that parking is being screened and isn't so visually prominent. Again, we have supplemental standards proposed uh, really to help make sure that the um, non-residential uses and proximity to neighborhoods aren't a nuisance. So things like uh, limiting hours of operation, uh, limiting the amount um, of, um, you know, retail sales of goods being required on site. So these are actually, um, you know, benefit uh, to the community that is surrounding it. Quick question. Mm -hmm. um, this is just for the neighborhood commercial, right? Because one of the thing, the feedback pieces we heard from businesses was that after COVID, all of them want drive through now because DoorDash is so big. They need people to be able to come in quickly and get out quickly. So will there be extra parking requirements that we can do for commercial in order to address that piece of it so that people can get food to go? 
Certainly. So we will um, definitely address as part of the next set of chapters that we develop um, access and mobility. So things like parking, making sure that there are, um, if you're going to have curbside pickup, we have dedicated spots just for that. All of those types of issues will certainly be addressed. And then in our other districts, um, which we'll get into the general commercial and the regional commercial, you'd still be allowed to do drive throughs uh, with a special use permit. Um, so this is really making sure that in our neighborhood commercial areas where we don't have you know, major uh, roadway corridors to handle the traffic that a drive through would really generate, we don't have that kind of issue. But in the areas where our infrastructure is really built out to support that traffic, uh, we that's where we're accommodating these drive throughs If you remember the map that was up there, the neighborhood commercial is fairly Very small. small. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Justin? Um, supplemental standards about limiting the hours of operation on outdoor seating and bars that are adjacent to residential. Um, what, what does adjacent mean? Does it literally mean right next door, or is it some sort of prescribed radius or uh, you know buffer? So the way that we've written it, it would be if you have a lot line, a shared lot line, uh, but we could certainly revise it if you have concern that it maybe needs to be an expanded area beyond just, you know, an adjacent lot line with the residential use. I would consider looking at the alternative buffer because sometimes just the lot line, is, I mean, the, the issue, in the, I interpret the issue as it being like noise or a, some kind of impediment in somebody to enjoy, enjoy their own home. And that could go across the street or. Yeah, that's a great point. You can certainly look into that. Your garden's right in the city, right? Is that in the zone, though? Because we're just talking in this zone, right? Right, just within the neighborhood commercial. Yep. So in areas where there's less proximity to residential, um, those limitations would be. It's really just meant to make sure we're not a nuisance. There. It is pretty close. Like, okay, so for example, if if uh, if this neighborhood commercial was adjacent, like the property line that's right next to somewhere on the edge of the zone, and, and next door is a you know resident, one of the, our residential districts. Um, even with this definition of adjacent, would that still apply because it would be, even though it's in a different zone? Yes. So it, it would primarily be trying to capture um, the district boundary line. So when you go from this neighborhood commercial district to a residential district, that's where, um, you know, we want to make sure we don't have any type of um, you know, noise spillover or our nuisance behavior. And I did misspeak earlier. I said that um, we only had the limit on hours of operation within the neighborhood commercial district. We do have it in other um, districts as well when adjacent to residential. There will be fewer um, opportunities for adjacency to residential um, in those other districts, but it's still there in case uh, there is that proximity. So we have the protection in place. Yeah, I would be interested to see how that, how a buffer might have been. Council in agreement with that? Because I looked in the pub you're talking about, Chris, is not zoned for that, but it is next to a neighborhood, so it might qualify for that reason. And a buffer might be an alternative. I don't know, but that could be something for them. Yeah, I wasn't saying we need a buffer. I just would like to see what they need to think about it as a, when they make the rules. So, well, and I think allowing it as an alternative would be interesting. Yeah. Is Council okay with that? I see some nodding heads. Yeah. <laughs> right. So moving into the general commercial districts, this would be more of our mid-scale shopping areas. Um, so think about like a, a grocery store, uh, you know, shopping center, something more uh, small scale community serving. Uh, this is really meant to make sure that we have um, all of the different use types uh, that are necessary here within the city, uh, make sure that we have these areas preserved uh, for the long term. Um, and again, for new development, want to make sure that that's more uh, pedestrian oriented and uh, better connected to surrounding development um, and include more public space.
So uses that would be allowed uh, within the general commercial district uh, would be very similar to the uses that are allowed in the neighborhood commercial district, but would no longer be uh, controlled by scale. Um, so at any scale, uh, those uses would be allowed by right. Uh, this district would also introduce auto-oriented uses, but would only allow those through a special use permit. Uh, this is another um, area where we heard a lot of feedback from residents about especially car washes and um, uh, gas stations, some of those other uses that they really feel are proliferating throughout the community. By making them special use, the city is able to just have another level of control over that. Uh, some other changes, we are proposing some new uh, by right uses, including um, above ground floor indoor self-service storage. So we know there's a really high demand for storage uses, um, but they are not the um, best looking or best use of land um, in the city. So uh, by allowing it above the ground floor, um, sort of in a mixed use building, we're still allowing these, accommodating the use, but in a way that's less important. And then by a special use permit, uh, live work units and uh, apartments above the ground floor would be allowed as well. Uh, so again, introducing uh, residential uses in a really limited way. Some other major changes that are being proposed, um, again, site orientation standards, very similar to the neighborhood commercial district, really proposed to help um, make these shopping areas more pedestrian oriented, easier for folks to uh, drive to park their car once and walk around rather than having to get in their car and drive between each of their destinations. Um, and the supplemental standards, again, are really meant to just um, help ensure that the um, operations of these general commercial uses are not going to have any negative impacts on surrounding development. Last but not least, for our commercial districts, we have regional commercial. So this would accommodate our really large scale uh, region serving uh, non-residential development. Uh, so it's really meant to create more of a destination. Um, and that is why some limited high density residential is proposed to be allowed uh, to really make sure that these areas can be vibrant um, and um, really in use all the time and not just at um, more peak hours. Uh, so new development in this district, we really want to concentrate along um, I-25 and E-470 to make sure that there's convenient access for minimizing any traffic congestion um, while still ensuring that there are good um, site connections uh, to um, internally and externally for people who are walking or biking uh, to the site. So in the regional commercial uh, district, this is where you'd have the most uses allowed by right. Um, so all the uses that would be allowed um, in the general commercial district, as well as some um, auto-oriented uses would be allowed by right here. Uh, breweries, wineries, distilleries, more large scale uh, would be allowed in this district as well. Uh, some of the uses that we are proposing remain special uses, um, include uh, vehicle fueling stations or gas stations um, and drive throughs uh, Distribution warehouse we know is a um, important one to have some additional level of scrutiny over. Um, it's just very clear in the comprehensive plan, so we're proposing that that be a special use as well. And then again, our supplemental standards, really just making sure um, that um, everything works well um, on site and with its neighbors. So the next district is the business park district. So this is meant to align with the employment center uh, land use category in the comprehensive plan. Um, it's meant to accommodate clustered areas of primary employment, uh, really supporting more of a uh, park or campus type of development pattern. Um, and we want to make sure that um, new development would vary in intensity with higher intensity developments located along I-25 and E-470, really try and keep those higher intensity uses closer to the highway. Uh, so by right in the business park district, uh, you'd be able to do a light and heavy industrial, brewery, winery, distillery, um, as well as some um, commercial uses as well. 
uh, for limited uses, uh, we have a storage or distribution warehouse. Uh, we are uh, proposing, um, instead of a limited use, that this be a special use, uh, require a public hearing in order to get this uh, more impactful type of use uh, within a business park. So some changes that are being uh, considered uh, for heavy industrial uses, currently they require a special use permit, but really the only additional standards that they are held to would be fire department requirements. Uh, so we are proposing that they be allowed by right, still be held to all of the fire department requirements. Um, so there wouldn't be any kind of change in the standard. Um, it would just be streamlining the approval process. Uh, we are also proposing, again, with the uh, distribution warehouse, uh, that this only be allowed in uh, specific locations as uh, detailed in the comprehensive plan. And then um, another big change would be drive-throughs. Uh, no more uh, drive-throughs in the business park zone, really keeping those within our commercial districts. And then for our supplemental standards, uh, we are restricting um, the uh, warehousing based on the size of the uh, warehouse in general. So if you are 150 square feet um, or more, or you have uh, a higher ratio of dock doors, then you would um, be considered a distribution warehouse and you'd only be allowed in a more limited location than if you were smaller or you had fewer dock doors, you'd be allowed in a, a broader area. Any questions on the commercial and employment districts? Yes. Uh, yes. You, you mentioned uh, pedestrian oriented mm -hmm. a couple of times. Um, how does that translate to like actual code? So, like, what, what things are included with that? that That's would, okay. would you say this is pedestrian oriented? So I think the biggest changes that we are proposing would be to the types of uses that are allowed and the requirements for um, site orientation and design. So um, use-wise, we're proposing, um, especially in the neighborhood commercial district, um, that more auto-oriented uses not be allowed. So uh, where uh, you have a lot of uh, you know traffic movement going in the drive-throughs, a gas station or whatever, it's just a more uncomfortable experience for a pedestrian. So that's one way. Um, another is by the site orientation standards. So um, if the um, as a pedestrian, if you have to walk through a huge parking lot to get to your destination, um, it's not going to feel as um, friendly or as if that development is oriented towards you than if the building was located closer to the street and the parking was to the side or to the rear of the building. So really just trying to switch the orientation of, you know, everyone's going to drive everywhere and the only way our, our, you know, developments are accessed are by driving to, you know, we also want to cater to pedestrians and bicyclists as well. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, let's actually take a step back to section three of those. So part of this commercial oh, no. mixed use, um, why aren't we creating, or I understand that there's no mixed use currently, but is there any reason why we don't just designate some areas and just have it be rezoning? I can answer that. Um, I mean, it's not to council. If council wants to actively rezone the property, we can do that. You know, that hasn't traditionally been for Thornton something that we really wanted to pursue just to protect property owner rights. Um, so, you know, we haven't actively pursued that. It just hasn't been the direction that we've gone in the past. So, but if council wants us to pursue that, you know, we can certainly reach out to property owners, but it, it definitely would involve a process. We wouldn't just want to do that without consulting that property owner. So. Okay. So. Oh, hold on. We got others that press their button. Justin. Um, so just so I understand that right. And it's mm -hmm. normally what happens is somebody comes in with a property interested in doing something and then that's when the rezoning instead of paying correct. the rezonings ahead what is any interest right that's so absolutely correct so so the city doesn't ever go out unless it happens to be city property so if the city owns a property we might go out to rezone it for example for parks and open space or something but um, other than that we wait for a property owner to come to us and submit a rezoning application um, but I'll also address too, in terms of the mix of uses, because we have incorporated allowance for residential and commercial districts and commercial and residential districts, we are also getting to that mix of uses. 
Um, so essentially, if you look at most of the districts, there's allowances now and sometimes even requirements, you know, in a few of the districts to actually have more of a mix of uses. So that's that's kind of um, how we thought without actively rezoning a property, we could get to that. And that, that's a pretty common practice, right? Like, yeah. Yes. Um, I guess I was going to ask this later, but Chris went down the path of mixed use. Would we, how are we going to incorporate these mixed use, all these new zoning codes to um, satisfy the requirements by HB 1313? Um, yeah, so would we have to preemptively resolve things or? Um, and so is that for the transfer oriented communities bill? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I would actually, we're, I know that the legal department's still looking through to make some judgment calls. So at this point in time, we may have to do some tweaks to our TOD districts. As of now, we're just kind of leaving as it is, but I think we're just going to have to consult with legal a little bit more once they, they go through and see what needs to be changed. So there could be changes coming. Um, but yeah, I think there's a lot of decisions to be made on that still. So, and I'm not prepared to give you a summary of that tonight, but we are working on okay. it. So we'll make sure we fold it into whatever the department is doing. Yeah. It's too new. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Did you want to add? No, I was just going to say, I agree with what Councilman Russell was saying about multi use. So, is there a way to encourage that without forcing it on? I don't know. Landowner. That's the direction I was going. We could just put it out there and might encourage it in some areas versus waiting for others to actively go after that type of zone. Uh, is that, or do you see that in other cities by like putting it out there to spur it? Yeah, I mean, you know, we have pre application meetings with people. And so when we do that, we talk about, you know, options for rezoning to mixed use. Um, so we certainly do try to put it out there. The city has stationary master plans for each of our station areas for TOD, the transit oriented development. So we have worked with property owners in the past to try to get them to rezone to it. They haven't necessarily been receptive, um, but you know, we, we can keep actively trying, especially I think if people are annexing into the city, um, we have a greater chance to, to say to those people, especially if it's in alignment with the comprehensive plan and the comprehensive plan requires a mix of uses, we have great latitude, I think, in that aspect to say, if you want to annex into the city, you have to align with the comp plan, and here's the zone district that you would have to use, this mixed-use district. So um, for us, I think that's probably our best bet for property annexing into the city, uh, just because, again, we, we have more say in what they can do then. So, I think one of, the, one of the hazards of a big project like this is if the public perceives that you're affecting their rights, um, it's probably the quickest way to torpedo the success of it. So our, our approach is more to provide opportunities and to incent to the best we can uh, people to take advantage of that through their own process. One thing we could consider, um, like on the screen here, it says um, with a special use permit, you could get multifamily above ground floor commercial. Perhaps um, at your direction, that could be allowed by right rather than special use. So it'd be easier for folks, there'd be less process involved with getting that type of mixed use development within the districts that you already have zoned on the ground today. What would be some costs for that, that if we were to change that use by right? Um, I mean, you do this very frequently off of what's your opinion of that? I think the only thing uh, that we would want to probably take another look at are the um, supplemental use standards to make sure that we're getting ahead of any um, issues that there might be with, you know, resident parking versus uh, commercial parking, um, you know, that type of thing where, especially I think if you were to redevelop an existing commercial center um, to include uh, mixed use uh, and multifamily above the ground floor. Uh, we just want to make sure that we are addressing any of the issues that could come across of trying to reuse an existing commercial site for that type of use. But I think we could certainly cover that in supplemental use standards. Uh, the only thing that it would take away would be the opportunity for a public hearing, uh, which um, the public might feel is necessary, but um, is often viewed as a barrier to developers. So um, certainly a um, kind of sticky wicket that we would be looking for direction from you all on um, the best way to move forward. And can I add to that? I think one of the main reasons we 
decided to make it a specific use permit in this zone in particular is because this is the zone for the Thornton Shopping Center. And um, so we didn't want to put it out there that, oh, this is just a use by right. And we're afraid the uh, neighborhood might get stirred up thinking that, um, you know, we're gonna put apartments at the Thornton Shopping Center, which we've heard uh, frequently that they don't want residential at Thornton Shopping Center. So to clarify that, it would still be an option, but it would have to go to public hearing for that to happen. <laughs> yeah, and just clarify to guess for the general commercial uh just general right, just, just public closure <clears throat> but that's Justin. Oh, Jessica pushed her button. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I, I appreciate the intent behind what you're saying, but when we give a special when we turn a special use into a use by right, that's when we get ourselves into trouble because we can't argue anything because now it's a use by right. And so I would rather always have a public hearing because in any case where we've had a contentious public hearing, the developers come back and adjusted or changed or we've come to some agreement where we did have a more meeting in the middle um, project. And so if it's a use by right, they get to do what they want and we don't get to say anything. I'm just with you that that's where I thought maybe it'd be utilized the mixed use that would create those areas around the city in which we could see future development going in. Um, yes, it's not difficult to do to get the rezone, but still if there's always there's always the ability to, like you said, have the, the special hearing, but we can target undeveloped areas around town that maybe are closer to transit, then we can encourage it that way without having to create those public. Maybe that's a good question for legal. Is there a way to kind of meet in the middle on that where new development has it as a use by right, but redevelopment doesn't? I don't see why that couldn't be considered. Because that yeah. might solve both problems. We could yeah, just trying to open it up a little bit, but I, yeah. I guess, again, for that transit oriented, you're looking at the south side of the city. And if we don't have the ability to have public hearing on those things, then our constituents are not going to be happy with that um, because we are, there's still parts in Ward 2 and Ward 1 around the transit area that are not developed. And so it wouldn't be redevelopment. And I would be very hesitant to just say, yep, put them all in right there because it's TOD. Um, well, I was targeting DOD though. I said, well, you just said TOD. I, I said it'd be more transit areas where we're uh, using like uh, the Yen Line, East Lake area. Thinking about that, <laughs> that is not, um, I would consider that South Thornton, 124th. You so, didn't specify. So when you said TOD, I, I just thought of our areas where transit's easily accessible. That's all bus routes, trains, things like that. Not specifically, yeah, not specifically TOD. But we have. Would there be a way to do an off ramp like we've done in some other of our regulations where the council can have the choice to do a public hearing? Or does it have to be a one size fits all? Because some areas, there may not be any concern, like East Lake is probably one of them, but other areas in South Thornton, it may be a huge concern, like Thornton Shopping Center. Yep, that's also an option we can consider as you develop it. Yep. So I, I, I do visualize East Lake being there, you're right there by the light rail, and we need more retail and ground level. We could also do multifamily in that area and lots of space in these fields. Those have already been zoned and projects have already been approved there. Yeah. For that, though, multifamily mixed use. I would just specify not saying transit or end line because that includes areas that we know that is not going to go over well unless we have a public hearing and we can get it where we want. Um, I'm always hesitant with use by right because we've been burned by it so many times in the past. Justin? Um, I don't, well, yeah, what's the, what's the pro risk of having uh, public hearings? And I guess that, again, mixed use zoning is what we're not utilizing at all. Mm -hmm. and that's what I'm suggesting that we do sprinkle or put that in somewhere versus this, which is what it's going to create again, which that's fine. Not suggesting to get rid of it, but we have mixed use zoning that we're not using anywhere, and it's they have to come in and rezone in order to get mixed use. Not the end of the world, but at the same time, it's not encouraging it either. 
in specific parts of the cities and specific parts of the city in which we may think as a group that it could be utilized. I'm saying we're just underutilizing it potentially. Um, well, I guess my, my response is that we, we zone, would there be a public hearing if we were preemptively rezoning? Yes. Correct. Yeah. So <laughs> would there be less to talk about in a public hearing? There would be a presentation from the uh, applicant to give us their, their vision and their project. It would be a presentation from our staff. So there'd be less uh, uh less things to discuss in the public hearing. I think we would lose out on some of that and some of that if we need um, I mean I agree that we want mixed use hard to forecast um what what the community wants to develop like business side. We might have to flip it back to it. Another one if we don't have any bites on something to do with mixed use. Karen? You, you had said regarding Chris's comment that we could say all new development, but not existing, or what was the verbiage that you had said? I didn't use the verbiage. I think it was redevelopment. Yeah, yeah redevelopment. Was question. Yeah. Question. So, right. I mean, are we open to at least doing new development? I think putting the verbiage in the code opens it up to at least giving people the idea that we're looking for mixed use. <laughs> There's some way we can include it. I understand what you're saying about <clears throat> use by right and that we don't want to overstep in that regard. I'm just trying to find a way for us to You know, you the fact that that's something we're looking for. Yeah, you usually want to give yourself the broadest provisions you can so you can make choices and on, you know, what comes to you. So, you know, an off-ramp, that idea where you could choose is something you could consider. But another, uh, Karen and I just sidebarred, and um, I think the idea of um, having the rezoning being a barrier to the mix, to using the mixed-use district um, we had thought perhaps when we get to the processes section, uh, we could take a look at uh, perhaps an exp expedited rezoning to the mixed use district. There's currently expedited processes for other things. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we could look at um, if there's a mm -hmm. specific target districts that we really want to encourage uh, rezoning into, perhaps an expedited process for that. Mm -hmm. That's a good solution. Mm -hmm. And that would be actually listed so that exactly yeah like so you have less process to go through if you want to be in this mixed use district uh versus if you wanted to maybe go to the residential high density district yeah and one clarification that won't go into the this article about the zoning district so when we get to the it's actually towards the end when we get to the article that talks about applications and development review process we would consider it then and we would talk to all of you about what that looks like so Yes, so that sounds like just incentivizing people through yep. an expedited process, which mm -hmm. we know we hear over and over that they want an expedited process. Yeah. I like that. I do have a question. We It says we've never used mixed use zoning, but we have mixed use projects. So how did that play in? Because obviously people had the same idea, but didn't use the mixed mm -hmm. use zoning. That's through plan development. Okay. So it's just used a different way, not necessarily not used, but just used differently. Right, and that's where a lot of those proposed streamlining to these districts is coming from. It's obviously there was some reason they didn't just rezone to the mixed use district. They went through the whole plan development process. So let's try and clean some of that up so it is a more attractive district to use. Roberta? I was just wondering if there were any other in incentives besides the expedited process for mixed use that are would be utilized or could be utilized or we are utilizing? Sure, I think um, in general, the allowances for the greater variety of uses and higher intensity and density of development would certainly be incentives uh, for a, a property owner or a developer to uh, rezone and use the mixed use district because you can just get more out of your property than you would be able to in any other district, except for the TOD. 
So that would be other ways that we could like include language that would. Yes. Yeah. And I think just kind of advertise that we're like really excited about that. Yes, exactly. I think we can certainly take a look too at the purpose and intent statement and, and maybe try and bolster that language up too um, and really make it as a kind of priority district for the city. So I'm hearing consensus agreements that we are supporting mixed use. We want to figure out ways to incentivize it, but not necessarily remove our ability to have a public hearing when needed. Yep. Is that clear enough? <laughs> <laughs> Yep, I think it's, yeah, I think it makes sense that in the commercial districts that are on the ground today continue to require that um, public process. And then uh, where we want mixed use and where it's, uh, where we have that rezoning, um, even if it's an expedited process, we'll still have a public hearing that's, you know, a state requirement. Um, so yeah, I think that we definitely wanna keep that public process while finding ways to incentivize mixed use. If we can do that. Thank you. Thank you for the creative solution solving. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of listen to go through, no worries. <laughs> <Close. laughs> all right, uh, so planned development districts. So you all are, I'm sure, painfully aware of the current planned development district process. Um, so we are proposing that the um, current uh, planned development process um, and district uh, be transitioned into a legacy district. So uh, no new land would be zoned to the PD. They wouldn't use the old uh, planned development district process moving forward. If you've been approved as a PD, of course, those standards would remain in place. Um, but really what we heard um, through um, all of our uh, stakeholder interviews and conversations with staff um, is that the plan development uh, process that you all have today allows for the creation of um, custom zoning uh, for a parcel that um, then requires staff to administer hundreds of different zoning codes rather than just you know, the city's one zoning code, um, but also doesn't really provide a lot of a good fair certainty to the developers, to the residents, because everything can be negotiated, right? There's no starting point for anything. Um, so instead of that old process, we're proposing instead um, to use an overlay approach. So the standards of the base district would be used as the starting point. Um, so let's say I'm in the mixed use district and I want to do um, something that's, you know, cooler, more innovative than that zoning district would allow. Uh, but in order to make it, you know, pencil out, I need uh, my buildings to be a bit taller or, you know, I need some change in maybe parking requirements or whatever. Um, so I would propose um, my, I would use all the other standards of the district, propose my deviations to those couple of standards, um, come to you all and say, this is my proposal, and these are the benefits that it's going to bring to Thornton. They'll be tied directly to goals that the city has, so it could be uh, sustainability or affordable housing or whatever those are. We're still working through what those uh, detailed uh, review criteria would be. Uh, but they would be asking for those um, deviations from the code in exchange for those benefits to the city. Um, so, you know, if you're not doing something better for the community, you need to use our new zoning code and meet those standards. So hopefully that will make sure that um, any deviations that you all are considering from the code is really um, because it's for the benefit of the community and not for the benefit of the developer or the property owner um, and then it just provides more fair certainty to everyone involved because we have the same base set of rules that we're starting from. Um, so we're really hopeful that this is going to help resolve a lot of the um, issues and concerns that folks had and some of the frustrations that I think were felt with the development process that I think are so much tied to that fair certainty and what you can and can't do and what can or can't happen on the property next to you. We, in a previous conversation, we talked about 75% of the cases that come forward are PD cases. <clears throat> PD cases require a great deal of upfront work by the applicant. And that is a part of the frustration that I think we've all had uh, in these things taking so long, because as, as was mentioned, you're negotiating every step of the way. And to have some base standards uh, makes that clearer. I think it's, it's more transparent to the questions on our proposed changes to plan developments. 
This is the biggest complaint I hear from developers. So thank you. Yeah, we're really hopeful that with the new district standards being really what's reflective of what's in demand in the market, they won't even need to use the PD process moving forward. It'll just be if they want to, not because they have to. That's the goal. All right, so last but not least, we have our other districts. Um, so we have some additional base zone districts that we're not proposing any changes to. Um, you will notice there's a main change that's proposed for the Civic Institutional District, um, but this is not a district that's currently zoned today, so it will not impact any uh, currently zoned properties. And then our East Lake districts, we are not proposing any changes uh, to those um, areas, as we know that uh, they're more sensitive uh, part of the community. We want to make sure that the standards that were put in place with those residents remain. All right, I will pass it back over to Karen. Okay, so in conclusion, um, staff would like to move forward with any changes that you have recommended to us today, uh, finalize the articles. And what we're proposing is to move forward uh, resolutions for article three and four to go through with the planning commission, the city council, hold public hearings just for these two articles and uh, ask you to approve those articles. Um, I do want to clarify that the approval doesn't mean adoption, so this wouldn't go into effect right now. Adoption will occur through the final ordinance of the entirety of Chapter 18 in summer 2025. Um, but basically, we just want to get councils buy-in that, yes, this is the correct way we want to move, so we can move on to the next articles and feel assured that this is what council wants to see. So if council is agreeable to that, um, we do already have the public hearing scheduled, so we would move forward with that. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. If council had direction on that, and again, happy to answer any other questions, then we can move on to just a few next steps as well. So. Any objection from council, given the feedback we've given on the section tonight? That doesn't preclude you from revisiting some of these issues, but because Absolutely. the code is kind of built on this, we need to have some of this uh, identified before we can go forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I do want to say, we do expect that as we move forward, some things probably do need to be revisited and there will be slight tweaks to things. If there are substantial changes to anything that we talked to you about, we would absolutely talk to you about that again um, in the future. So, all right. So um, next steps, oops, I got to change this. Okay, so next step, so we actually go to Planning Commission tomorrow night to do the same exact presentation. So we'll get feedback from uh, Planning Commission. And like I said, we're ready to just go ahead in June with the public hearing for Planning Commission and then uh, go ahead in July for a public hearing for City Council. We've got a couple more outreach aspects. We are gonna go to Thornton Fest just to be available to talk to people. Um, we have another Thornton Joint Task Force meeting coming up uh, in June. So that's the Home Builders Association. And we will uh, talk to them about the articles. We'll give them the opportunity to review the articles, provide any comment or feedback. Uh, and then we move automatically right into the next phase. It's gonna start pretty soon. We're gonna be looking at four new articles that deal with uh, more development standards, design standards, landscaping and buffers, and then uh, access and mobility looks at things like parking and, and other aspects. So that'll start soon. And then we'll uh, be coming back to council to start discussing those as well. So, so that's it. Any questions from council? Thank you very much. All right, thank you thank so you much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is discussing potential charter amendment ballot questions. Uh, yes, I'll kick us off on this one. Erica Delaney Liu has drafted these questions and along with the city clerk's help, and uh, we have consulted on uh, with SIRSA, our risk manager, on these questions too. I did send the ballot questions as drafted to all of council, and I haven't had any comments back from, from you. So if you have any comments, we would appreciate receiving those tonight. The ballot questions uh, then are set to the ballot question is set to come back to council by ordinance on June the 25th with second reading of the ordinance on July 9th. So it's already scheduled on your look ahead. Um, if we can agree on the uh, language here tonight. So with that, I'm gonna let Erica walk you through the, the ballot questions as currently drafted. All right, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Tammy just noted, we're following up. We were last here on April 2nd uh, to discuss 
the original question that was posed to staff was um, a ballot question that would change how council vacancies were filled, moving from council appointment to fill the remainder of the term of the vacancy to holding either a regular or special, special election to fill that vacancy. But during the course of that discussion, council wanted to expand the consideration of ballot questions to the mayoral office as well, and potentially filling that instead of at the next regular election um, to a, filling it at a special election. And then at the end of the discussion, a question came up regarding the language also in part 4.5 of the charter that has to do with being absent therefrom continuously for three months, constituting a vacancy in an office of council member. So we did go out, um, the city clerk's office and I went out and researched other charters and contacted other cities to find out sort of what they do. And we'll have that information towards the end of this slide. Um, Kristen said she would be listening. She's on Okay, thank, thank you. <laughs> All right, so this slide is really just a placeholder to remind everyone of the existing charter language. Um, obviously, council has already reached consensus to try and move forward with changing at least one of these three sections, but I wanted all of the language here in case we have to refer back to it. Um, you'll see in your packet that the questions that have been proposed, even though the first one that council wanted to tackle had to do with 4.5b, the order that they've been presented is the first one would change 4.5a, the second would change 4.5b, and the third, um, if you move forward with that tonight, would change 4.5c. And that's just legislative drafting generally. You tackle an ordinance in the order that it currently exists. Um, so that's the only reason why the mayor's question does appear first. So this is the proposed ballot question for changing the vacancy of mayor from being elected at the next regular election to a special election uh, to occur within 120 days of the vacancy, but not within 90 days of a regular municipal election. We've also provided the red line language. Um, when we were here on April 2nd, we had a bit of a discussion about whether we, whether council might want the red line language in it or not. Um, I've looked at ballots. Some cities put the red line in, some cities don't. I think that's entirely up to the city. You can see that the question itself is a third of the length of the red line. So it's up to council sort of to give direction on whether you think it's confusing to have both, if you'd prefer to just have the question. Um, but that is the red line that would show exactly what the changes would be based on a yes vote to this question. Jessica, you push on this. Are you gonna go at each one? Oh, yeah, well we or... can, yes. I didn't know if you wanted questions and comments in between or through the whole thing first, so. What are you Wait. wanting to do? <laughs> Should we let her present all three and then we can debate? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, so um, so the same setup, obviously, for the second question regarding council members. This red, red line is a bit cleaner because it is striking out everything having to do with the appointment. Um, the one for mayor was a little more convoluted, um, but again, it's the red line itself is about twice the length of just the ballot question. Um, the question might also come up as to whether you would want to combine questions A and B. Uh, those two are of similar enough na nature that they could be combined into one ballot question, um, but I would recommend that C or three stays its own ballot question. Uh, so just reading it out, shall section 4.5B of the Thornton City Charter be amended to provide that when a vacancy in the office of, office of council member occurs, such vacancy shall be filled by special election to be held within 120 days of the vacancy, but not within 90 days of the regular municipal election. So as you can see, that's very similar ballot language to the mayoral list. You had a Those, so the red line does look different. You have a question now or at the end? Okay. All right. So moving on to the third, this is where we had to go and get some additional information. Um, so we reached out to a number of cities um, and you'll see there's a lot of variety in how it's addressed, ranging from not at all in a number of charters to some in great detail. So the one with the greatest detail is gonna be Lafayette. You're gonna see that it's actually in two separate sections here, um, but I wanna run through them a little bit. The, with the ones that are silent as to what kind of absence from a council person would constitute a vacancy, um, there's a number of them, Aurora, Northland, Littleton, Inglewood, Golden, and Pueblo. Um, 
we reached out, Northland got back to us and they have no written policy regarding a duration or number of vacancies. And um, Lakewood's not on that list, but they, we did reach out to them too. We couldn't find it, uh, but they're in the next, they're in the next section down. So then there's a smaller group of communities that don't say five absences is a problem. Instead, they say that uh, no identified number of absences, but say chronic absenteeism or just absenteeism that someone is bothered by could be grounds to be misconduct, right? Or one of them uses the language refusing to serve. So if, uh, if a particular council person doesn't appear at enough meetings, other council people would then make a claim they're, they're refusing to serve. So for example, on this in Westminster, um, how it's actually stated in there is that two members of council can vote to compel the attendance of an absent council member and then failure to attend after notice by that council member would be guilty of misconduct unless excused by a majority of council. So basically certain council members would be alleging that the absence became a problem and then all of council together could say, well, there's good cause for that absence and therefore excuse it. Uh, but otherwise, if council didn't feel that it should be excused, that could be misconduct, which is grounds for removal under other actions, right? Um, so then the third group or the third bullet point is um, there's five communities that have defined it as absence from regular consecutive meetings of a certain number. And these go from Boulder, where on the fifth consecutive, consecutive meeting, unless excused, that is a vacant position. Uh, and then Denver has fourth on their fourth meeting. Lafayette is also on their fourth. And then Lafayette has another provision we'll get to at the end. Arvada is on their third and Colorado Springs is on their third. And I just want to clarify, this is regular consecutive meetings. Uh, so it wouldn't necessarily include special meetings and it wouldn't include planning sessions, council updates. It's the regular meetings of those, um, of those <laughs> communities. So the final ones, are absence from consecutive meetings for a duration of time. Fort Collins has all regular and special meetings for 60 days, which could, if it's, I mean, if it's November, December, that might not be very many meetings, but at another time of the year, it could be a lot of meetings, right? So that's very variable by the schedule. Um, Thornton, our language is absent continuously there from for more than three months. There's no specific mention of meetings. And one of the comments that we got back from Sursa was you might want to clear up there from <laughs> exactly what does that mean? And then um, the only other community that has language exactly like ours is Greeley and they use six months, which absent there from for six months, that's a really long time. Uh, Lafayette, in addition to having the fourth consecutive meeting being uh, constituting a vacancy. They also have language that says absent from the city for more than 30 days, miss four meetings or 25% in a year. And if, I'm sorry, I'm jumping around. If you go back up to Lakewood, they also have the 30% in a year grounds for removal. So um, Lakewood and Lafayette look to be the only communities who are looking at the whole year as a whole, as opposed to um, relying on the consecutive attendance. Roberta, is your question on this? Yeah, it was on that slide. Um, that one, which seems really crazy too, like absent from the city, like what does that mean? So I would think, like how I would interpret Lafayette's is the four consecutive meetings is specific to meetings. Absent from the city, to me, implies if they went to Europe for 31 days, right? Um, and... We didn't I mean, that mean anything to anybody though, right? Like, I mean, like you didn't come to events or I don't know. Exactly. And that's also why uh, Sam White, the general counsel for SIRSA said, you guys should consider cleaning up your there from because ours just says absent continuously there from. Does that mean in the city? Does it mean meetings? Now is the opportunity to clean that up. Yeah. So um, with that being said, this proposed ballot question is really just a shell, right? And we need council direction and discussion whether you would want to change it. So this, currently this would just be if you decided to take the easiest road and change it from 
absence constitutes a vacancy from three months continuous absence to two months, right? That's easy and quick, but it doesn't clean up the there from prob problem. And um, it also has no, like no tie to, to the number of meetings, which is why I've also highlighted in the current charter language or is absent continuously there from for more than three months. So if you just change that to two months, you still, it, it's subject to debate what that means. And so the suggestion would be what? To clarify which meetings and yes. consecutively or not? Yes, and I would I would suggest, um, based on what, what we've seen from other studies, um, I think the regular consecutive meetings or regular regular or special consecutive meetings, I think that would be the clearest way to go. Set that at a particular number. And then also, um, but I think you should be clear if you're leaving out planning sessions and council updates. And that would be my recommendation as well. Um, but I think, I think that regular or special consecutive meetings and a particular number is much clearer. And I think it also provides the flexibility that, that is necessary from the calendar you set at the beginning of the year, right? Like November, I've only been here two years, but November's very light in meetings or has virtually no meetings. And so um, so I think that, that using those consecutive meetings and the fact that you set a calendar at the beginning of the year gives you some flexibility. Um, you also, like I said, Lakewood and Lafayette have policies regarding a number of meetings or percentage of meetings throughout the course of the year. If you were going to include planning sessions or council updates, then you might want to do a percentage. Um, but my recommendation would actually to be to stay with the official meetings at which council takes action, which is regular and special meetings. Karen, did you have a question? Okay. I think that was the last slide, right? There, well, there's one more okay. just as a reminder of sort of <laughs> what we need discussion and direction from you all on. And that's just the purpose of the last slide. But um, any questions you may have, and we can spend more time on each of the ballot questions now. Um, I apologize. I was just in a hurry after the last presentation. Karen. So I wanted to, before we start talking about any verbiage, I want to propose, so a couple things. One is that we have a lot of things on our charter that need to be going to the ballot. And I believe we should be taking a thorough look at everything that needs to be changed. I would like to propose, and we don't, we're not going to vote on this tonight. We're going to vote on it in this council meeting, but I would like to only have one ballot question this year. And that would be the appointment process. I'd also like to change that. I can't remember what it said, but I think if it's nine months to a year, and I think we kind of discussed this between all of ourselves, if it's nine months to a year, it should still be an appointment. But if it's two years or more, then it should be a special election. So what I'd like to see is both of the others wait and we don't put them on the ballot this year, because I just think, it's a bigger conversation about a whole lot of things on our charter that are really ready to be updated and amended. Um, and I think we just need to take some time in the next year going through that. And then maybe we have, and I don't know how you do this on a ballot, but I mean, maybe you could have everything regarded to our city charter in one spot on the ballot. I don't know how that works, but I'm just thinking, let's do a huge amendment or a huge ballot initiative next year and this year just do the vote on um, the appointment process but also change that because I think nine months to a year doesn't warrant a special election that should still be appointment. So would you like that ballot question for both the mayor and the council members? Because you could combine it into one right? Yes. So you want to combine it? Into I guess so yeah I mean I was just thinking council members personally but um, it's not combined. The two sections will appear the, the on question, the ballot question. Yeah, the question it's, could be combined, but, but the red lines would not be. Right. You see each section, but it's one ballot question. I think it's more an issue for council members um, 
so that again, if they're leaving, <clears throat> if it's nine months to a year before the next election, fine, we do an appointment process. But if the term still has two year, you know, over one year, obviously, then we go ahead and do a special election only in that ward. And I'm just thinking that we do that and not the others. So yeah, I guess my thought is just council members only. Mm. Just do this section. Just this. None of the others. Less than two point. years a point. More than two years. Two years or more. I think it was one year. If it's a one year or less. One year or less a point. Right. But still we'll still do an appointment. Because it doesn't make sense to spend money on the special election in that respect. Okay. Jessica? Um, okay, so I can live with taking off the attendance one for now, but I think we have to include the mayor because if it is the mayor that leaves, it, it changes the whole dynamic. If the mayor pro tem goes up, then that seat's vacant, and then that seat doesn't get filled. And then it that's, should be that's one more. Though, by this. No. No. It doesn't. Only it, it wouldn't. It would, the seat would be empty until the next election. The mayor would mayor pro tem would become the mayor. The council seat would then be empty until the next election. So I, I kind of feel like we have to include the mayor. I'm okay with combining. The one thing I'm not okay with still, I like the red lines because I think that helps people read we are changing. And I think that's good for people to understand. I still don't like that there's no mention of, and I know it's not a tax, so we don't have to, but I feel like there should have to be something in there that says at a cost to the city at the very least, because most people are not going to understand or read whatever information we're putting out there. And if we're truly transparent, then it should say at a cost. To that ward. Yeah. So at the end of the slideshow, there is a, a copy of a proposed pro and con statement, and it was drafted for all three ballot questions. Um, and obviously it's subject to change by what actually you decide to send to the ballot. No, it was in the packet, um, but it's not on here. And I think again with that though, is a lot of people aren't going to read that. They're just going to read their ballot and that's going to be their first time. I mean, there are a lot of people that read the blue book, pros and cons, but there's probably more that don't. And so I think it should be on the ballot question at a cost. I guess, can it be? That is the question, because yeah, from a legal well, perspective, it's like, uh, well, I want to answer the question if it, if it even can be part of the question. The pro-con statement? No, no, in the no. ballot. A cost, specifically. Oh, putting the cost of the special. No, it would not cost. need to be part of the question. It would not. Not uh, the actual cost, just at a cost. Because you're actually changing the ballot. Oh, or the okay. charter language, that and that would language would not be in the charter. But it is a cost. I mean, I don't know how you do it, but it's it's just isn't transparent at all in any way, shape, or form. Typically, that information would go in a pro con statement, but um, I mean, I guess the ballot question could indicate that. In, in all the samples that I saw, it was a question, <laughs> a question, and red lines, but there was nothing with regards to the cost or how it would play out in in the charter okay. amendment ballot question. So the actual red line would be the new charter language, yes. but the question is not the charter language. That's so correct. It could go in the question at a cost. I'm just asking that we add something that says it is not a free but, process. So, to, but to clarify, the question is actual charter language. No, it's not. Shall the charter be amended to provide and then the red lines are. So I think you would put it in after um, shall be filled by special election at a cost yes. to the electors <laughs> to be held within. And, and like we discussed a little bit last time, it's very difficult to anticipate or estimate an amount of costs. And I think just putting at a cost to the electors <laughs> is fine. Just so they know, it's not free. 
All right, so as I'm getting consensus on these items, are you okay with the proposal on the less than or equal to one year, still a point greater than one year special election? As long as it says in there at a cost, yes. If not, then no. <laughs> Justin? I think add a, adding the words at a cost adds more question marks. Because I put a could be a million dollars, it could be <laughs> Look, how does that answer that question? When we put in the information in the pros and cons, will we will be able to provide more more info? I mean, so if you're just looking at the, I don't see how adding at a cost helps that much at all. Right. So, you want your pro con statements to be objective, so you know we recommend we draft those. We put the draft uh, pro con statements in there, and they start at page two seventy three of your packet. If you wanted to look at those, they're fairly simple. But for example, one says a special election for award can result in additional cost to the city. But there's also a pro in there too. So. Yeah, does it say examples of how much? No, because we, we're unable to estimate that. I, I would say we don't need we can see timeline. So I agree with removing that question altogether, and I agree with Elaine, the mayor, and the council member question. Um, I don't think we need to add it at a cost. What about the time frame of appointing versus special election? Um, the less than or equal to one year? year? Yeah, I guess one year would be in favor. If we're going to do the mayor well, and the mayor for him, we might as well do the other one. If we're going to do two, let's do three. No, but there'd be one question. One question. One question. One question. So one question. Yeah. Okay. Because the subject matter is, yeah, because the subject matter is similar enough between the mayor and the council member, those two can be combined. Yeah, to, to be clear, I would only be okay with you. We, I only want to have one question. That's, that's it. So we Thank combine you. council member, mayor. And it's just one question that would be okay but and again it will be more than one question is not but multiple red lines case. yeah but it will be two sections within the two question sections. one on the mayor one on the council okay yes but i'm, I'm only okay with asking for one one vote for people who are voting and karen that was your comment because you were next yes um i agree with i think oh what i wanted to say is Yes, we need to say in the pros and cons that it's a cost. Can we not put a information like it's only going to one ward, the ward for which? But I also want in the pros, I wanted to say specifically, this is so you have a vote, you have a say. I mean, so in the draft pros and cons, that language is included. Um, so I'll, I'll just say that if we combine the questions, if it becomes one ballot question, it will read something like shall sections 4.5 A and B of the Thornton City Code City Charter be amended to provide that when a vacancy in the office of mayor or council member occurs, such vacancy, if within less than or greater than or equal to greater, one year, greater than then. or equal to one year of the remainder of the term, shall be filled by special election uh, to be held within through the rest of that <coughs> the rest through the rest of that language is greater than one year sorry yes okay, greater than again. greater than one year so if we did that one question that means the votes for it it would change both sections of the charter and we can include the red line for both sections on the ballot to make it entirely clear that both sections will be changed changed by one yes vote um in the pros and cons, if we do one question, then then the pros and cons would be combined. How how I compared this one had them separately, and I can just um, explain the pro. Well, the the cons, I guess, is what people are more concerned about. For the mayor question, the charter already provides for resident elected representation as opposed to council appointment to fill a vacancy in the office of mayor. A citywide special election will result in additional costs to the city. And the con for the council member 
is a special election for a ward can result in additional cost to the city, right? But it's for, for a ward. Um, the pro was provides for resident elected representation to fill a council member vacancy instead of appointment by city council. Now that pro is a stronger pro than the one to change the mayoral. And that's because the mayor is already filled by election at the next regular election, right? It's just speeding it up. Um, and so the pros and cons are a little bit different for the two sections. However, if we combined it to one question for the mayor and council member, um, it, it, like we could say in the cons, well, I don't know that we would want to say in the cons that it costs more to do the mayor because we're doing it as one question. It's factual and that's why I don't think they can be separate. Yeah. That is factual. We should include that. Okay. <laughs> Robert, that's why it can't be one question. Um, <laughs> is there any way just to say that all elections cost money and that obviously these would cost money? Like, I just feel like it's like, like this is, it's going to cost extra money. I think people would get that, right? Yes. Yes. I mean, you're only only the ward is voting, right? For the yeah, council. but I think it's, it's like, a citywide special election. Yeah, event, right. So there are differences in those costs. Right? Yeah, I, 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 and I don't know that people would understand that, but I think that all elections cost money. I like that it's in the in the pros and cons. I think it's a good thing to let the public know. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I don't have anything against that. I think that the thing too is like with the ward language, it sounds a little weird, like it's costing your ward. I don't know if that's what I don't know if it's saying that's it, but the way we were talking about it right now, it sounds like it's gonna cost the, the ward. ward. Okay. Right, right. It's not gonna cost the ward. It's gonna cost the city that's money right. for that ward, but it's not gonna come out of your like street no, budget no, or something. It's not. So okay. And then is there anything else? Yeah, I'm in favor of what council member Martinez said of like putting all of it in one question, two sections pros and cons on the sheet. Um, so I just want to be clear. When we say one question with two sections, you want people voting once. Yes. yes. Okay. But two paragraphs that you're voting for the same ideology of changes with via the two questions. Well, I think it's going to be one question with two okay. sections of red line. Okay, cool. Okay. But they're only going to vote once. Yeah. yeah. And and if you if you divide it up, then they start voting twice. <laughs> even sometimes even when there's no, not no, a no, it would still be one question, but just be like two chunks with the two sections showing exactly the red line changes. Karen, you pressed your button again, but we haven't heard from Chris or Dave or Tony yet. So hi, I've written down here um, that I'm getting with the one year plus of the timeline. I had a no at the cost just because it seems more logical than the pros and cons and that seems to be what you said is typical um and then i i was in support of the combined question for mayor and council to started talking about the pros and cons piece and how that then doesn't get it clear so um i'm not certain on that one but first you i am dave i'm good with it being just one ballot question and then just having the the pros and cons listed for the cost to me hopefully people read that so. and the time frame yeah one year okay. and tony uh, uh i agree uh, with just what david had to say right there uh, to, to simplify that okay and karen back to you thanks um i just think the ballot so again if we move forward after tonight um we can still put all three of these back on the ballot um, if we want to. So we have to be prepared for all of them when we go to council, correct? Uh, what are you saying? When we redo the whole charter? or No, but when we go in on June 25th to vote right. for these, I'm assuming you're going to have all of them ready to go. I thought council we're not making any decisions this evening. Right, so, but I thought your yeah. direction was to go with just one ballot question. And it's the mayor and council member. Well, I don't think that's our direction yet. And I also think um, I don't see how you can make one ballot question with separate 
when you're saying in the pros and cons, because a mayor's position has to be voted on by the entire city, that's a whole different situation than, and I understand we don't need to put a dollar, you know, we're not saying it's costing your board. But it is only going to one ward, which is a lot different cost than going to the whole city. So I don't, I really don't think combining these makes sense because they're two separate issues. If you want to make them two separate ballots, fine, I'm fine with that. But making them one ballot question is super confusing and it won't work. Well, there is a single subject rule for a ballot question. And um, I think it's single subject because we're talking about in each instance, a special election, um, you know, if the seat is vacant a year or more, a year, more than a year. So that's the topic that we're talking about. Right. There be but a special the cost election. is so different. So people might say, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm okay with it one way, but I'm not okay with it the other way mm -hmm. because of the cost. And that's why I'm saying I think they're separate issues. So if we want to make them, I'm just throwing it out there. I think that's two separate mm -hmm. Questions. I don't have an issue with the question itself. I have a question and an issue with them being all combined. This might just be my own beef, but <laughs> I think this is a beef of many voters. But like, is there any way to put like a little preamble thing here about like why vacancies occur? Like what vacancies are, like what they like, I don't know that like voters under would understand all this. Totally. I think it's described in your issue before the pro and con statement. It, it's more appropriately in the pro and con statement. And yes, you could say, you know, this question is here because council members currently under the charter can be removed and re replaced by appointment. And they you know, like the and have to yeah, down like they a move few out different of the things like that's and I think that's the reason I say that is because when when voters want to be informed of who is when they're electing people initially, <laughs> that's just a good question in forums to ask. Do you plan to stay for your seat? Do you plan to stay until the end of your term? So I know not everybody can like say that, but it's just it would be like you know that that's part of it. Anyway, that's just probably my thing, and I just. Um, it is what it is. No, I get that. I mean, an explanation is 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 needed. So I guess voters. my concern with an explanation is any explanation we give needs to go back to section C of the charter, which defines a vacancy. And that's, I mean, it's quite wordy, right? <laughs> a vacancy shall exist when an elective officer fails to qualify, dies, resigns, is removed from office, yeah, moves from okay. the city, moves from the ward from which elected is incapacitated, right? So my worry in putting something to explain how vacancies occur is that it goes back to that language. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I get you. <laughs> Jessica? Um, I was just wondering if you could put in the combined section for the pros and cons, um, since it is 4.5A and 4.5B, could you put that as 4.5A, is that the mayor's one, is a cost for uh, the entire city 4.5 b is the cost to the electors and that i think we could put that in the pros and cons okay. um but understanding that it's one question no i think it's fine as if you can share it or show it that uh differentiation between 4.5 a and 4.5 b i'm okay with the one question i i'll just be very vocal about the part of at a cost and then people will know and not be confused all right, we'll have to reach consensus on that as well. But Justin, I know uh, I want some clarification on the uh, what would happen with the existing charter if the, uh, the mayor there's a vacancy in the mayor's seat and that seat had let's say three years remaining up. So the way I understand it is the mayor pro tem be acting there for three years. Well, that's actually not correct. Not correct. It's the next regular election. So, and so the city holds a regular election every two years. And so the current language of the charter provides that if if a mayor left before the term was up, they, the new mayor at the next regular election would just start a new 
four year term. So it could go four year, two year, four year, four year, whereas council member was changed so that that appointment gets the rest of the term to always keep it on a four year. Okay, so then, so in that scenario, the mayor, the mayor's election would be held in two years earlier than normally. Yes. And would that election be for a four year term? Yes. So then the, the mayor cycle would change to a different year? It would. And you'll see that's why the, um, the red line at the end of this, at the end of, at the end of the red line, <laughs> um, changes it from, because we would be doing it a special election, we would have the term of the mayor elected at the special election be for the original mayor's term rather than a lesser amount so that it would always be four years. Okay. Um, and, okay, so then, then the, the mayor pro tem would be serving as the mayor, acting mayor until the next election. And the, there would be a vacancy that would go unfilled, right? It wouldn't be a vacancy. It's not it a vacancy. Be, That's it would just be there wouldn't be nine members on council. There would be eight members on council. And then when you have the special election, the mayor pro tem would resume their remaining term as council member. And then you would have nine. Okay. So now, now that I understand that, I really, you know, it does, maybe it doesn't make that much sense to even mess with the mayor's term because it's it's not like we're going to have a scenario where there's an extended period of time. We're going to, at the very most, have one year and 11 months of a, of a small council and every, you know, every month forward is, is a smaller term. 50% of that would be the same as if we didn't change it. Right? If it was less than a year or a year or less, there would be no effective difference. So if I would actually be, you know, now that that's been explained to me, I would be okay with just, just focusing this whole uh, ballot question on council and not the mayor, since we have a mayor pro tem and the mayor's election would change, the, the cycle would change, so it, it would eliminate an extended period of time of, of an of a eight-member council. So I'm okay with just take, moving it to, to the council. Chris? In that one-year, 11-month time with Mayor Pro Tem acting as mayor, can we then uh, select a new Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. So that position doesn't go away. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. But you would still need someone to backfill the mayor, so that role would still be there too. No, Is that correct? I want to Robert research Drew. that. Yeah. Uh because you know, you may just not, and then the mayor pro tem serves, and then you elect if the mayor pro tem is gone. You elect from your body who you want to chair that particular meeting, oh, but I need to check that for sure. I I don't think you elect a new mayor pro tem in that circumstance. But I'll answer that question in in an email for you for sure. It's a giant hawk back up. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, um, I guess again, if we're going to have a one year and eleven month term for the this situation. <laughs> then it should be the same for a council member. So we're saying a year or more, then we must have a special election, except for the mayor. And then it's okay if it goes more than a year. That doesn't make any sense. And you're still eight members of council and you're still technically, some ward is not going to have two full members of their ward. So I don't think it's, it's not the same. You can't say for the mayor's seat, it's okay for one year and 11 months, but it's not okay for a council member seat. Council members are the ones that leave more often than the mayor. And so why wouldn't we just make it for two years in that case for everybody? I'm just gonna be thinking though, that comment just gonna be thinking that just because the mayor pro tem becomes the mayor doesn't mean that they're not still representing their there's more. You're still a ward council member. So does that mean that would still, there would still be 
two representatives, if the only mayor seat was vacant, each council, each ward would still have two council members of wards. So does that mean that the mayor who's currently in Ward 4, there's three Ward 4 representatives? It doesn't. So you're just changing what the mayor is based yes. on this. I just disagree with that. You can't just make it fit your narrative to fit this. All right, so I think there's consensus. Item three is off the table, correct? Everybody said that's off the table. I think the question we're down to is whether or not to combine one and two or to just do number two. I think there is, well, looking at the numbers on consensus, we have three that have said number two only. And with me, five who have said combine the two together for one question. So then the next question becomes, we, we have one question on the ballot that says mayor and the council. The next question becomes the time frame. And so there is consensus that says that greater than one year becomes a special election. One year or less is an appointment. Karen? Did you just say there was five consensus? Yes, we have Jessica, that? Roberta, Dave, Tony, and me to consensus to combine into one question, number one and two together. And so that after that has been decided, well, that consensus. we're still consensus is not a vote. So does that mean we're still we still have the ability to change that at the council meeting? So the consensus is to bring it forward for a vote. So the language that comes forward is based on what we're discussing tonight. One, two, three, four. And Roberta, me, Tony, Tony and David, and Roberta, Jessica. Is that your is that your vote? So and I am running the meeting the right now. Yeah. Okay, well, well, are you changing your consensus or are you leaving it the same? This feels kind of bullyish yeah. to me. So <laughs> let me have the conversation. If Roberta would like to speak, then she can press her button well, and be asked to speak. I just to make sure we have consensus. That's exactly what I'm doing right now. And so there are five that have said to combine the two questions. And then the, the next piece would be greater than one year would be a special election. Less than or equal to one year would be an appointment. So that is what has been said at this moment. If there's anyone that wants to change that, now would be the time to do that. And I didn't talk about why I support combining the two. When we talk about how the mayor is just another seat on the council, that is absolutely correct. However, the mayor is an at-large person. And so to move it so when the mayor leaves, to not treat it as the same as the rest of the council, then essentially the, the city does not have a representative at large to represent them. They have individual council members, but they don't have the at-large vote. They voted for the mayor, just like they vote for the council members. And so I feel like if we're going to change this, we have to change it for both, not just for the council seat. And I think that people understand it's going to cost money. I think they know that's gonna happen. And I think they actually would like to see that in other places other than local elections. And we've heard that a lot over the last year. So to me, it makes a lot of sense to put it in one question to make sure that it goes forward and make sure that people have the choice to say, yes, I want a special election for all of my representatives, not just one of them. And what Justin was saying earlier was that is... <laughs> There are, there's, it had to do with timing. Is that correct? One year, 11 months. One year, 11 months for a, a mayor seat, but it would be the same for council, is that correct? No. no, it would be one year. We would do a special election if it was more than one year. And it's one year, 11 months for mayor? As it currently stands, yes. So we're saying it's okay to have the vacant mayor seat at, filled by the mayor pro tem for, two years, but it's not okay to have two years in a council seat. Yeah, I'm gonna stay with my vote or my consensus. Can, your did. agreement. So the language that will move forward, and I, I believe it'll be next week, right? The, at the formal meeting? June 25th. June 25th will be the language that's agreed to is that there will be one question that the pros and cons can break it out or can put it together. I do think it might be confusing if it's not together, but I think people understand that there is a difference in cost related to it. And I think if they're willing to, I mean, what was it you said just in the price of democracy, right? Mm -hmm. They're willing to pay the price in order to get democracy, then they're willing to pay the price in order to have fair representation. Mm. Make that statement. It cracks me up every time I hear you. It's so many. It's All right. So I think we have consensus to move that forward. 
So if it's greater than, if the vacancy would be greater than one year. Vacancy greater than one year is what has been agreed to tonight. In both sections, mayor and council. And one okay. question. Okay. Let me just check the last thing here. Because we ditched number three, Correct. and then we will update the factual summary so that you'll see that um, on June 25th. Okay. That's all I need. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, should we take a five minute break? <laughs> uh, I think Tony is still online, right? All right. We will move on to the next topic, which is the proposed rules of order and code of conduct. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Tim Yellico, City Attorney, and Adam Stevens, Deputy City Attorney, is here with me too tonight. Um, we have three items that we want to get through with you. Uh, the first one is changes to your audience participation provisions in your City Council rules of order. This has already passed City Council on first reading. Um, but Council Member Henson had a question on this document, so I uh, wanted to bring it back and um, talk it through one more time. Maybe you can get the number line up there. So the changes would do three things, I think. Uh, they require that members of the public sign up in advance of public comment and the other way. And then also that they uh, note whether or not they're a resident of, this, of the city of Thornton. And in-person speakers would be heard first and those residents of the city uh, will be given preference in the order they're heard in public comment. And then finally, likewise with the uh, electronic participation, you have to sign up, say whether or not you're resident, uh, the residents would go first. But we also had a requirement in here that folks sign up for the electronic portion of the public comment, uh, the remote uh, commenters, uh, at the time that the remote commentary begins. And Council Member Hansen said she thought it should be open, I believe that's what she's saying, during the remote commentary. The reason why we put in there that you have to sign up at the point when remote comment begins is we have seen where a lot of uh, commenters are uh, adding on once they see if their position um, gets through in, in many of these trolling situations that other cities have, have um, experienced. So, and Adam's kind of been researching that. He might want to talk about that a bit too. It, you know? it, yeah, thank you. And I mean, we unfortunately had the one incident of, of Danny Semitic comment a couple weeks back and that was consistent with what we've heard from other jurisdictions, including Lakewood, Wheat Ridge, <clears throat> Durango. And the problem is when 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 you we have an open-ended public comment period for in-person people, they're already in the room. And, and it's possible theoretically for somebody to quick drive down to City Hall and jump in line. It's unlikely. But when you're opening yourselves up for remote comment worldwide, in effect, because of the internet's reach you can find yourself in a situation where these comments will attract multiple comments, or if people choose to be uh, deceptive and dishonest, they can just re-sign re, uh, up using a different aim and, um, you know, in feign like they're somebody else. And so you're, you're, you're exposing yourself to a constant cue that in essence would never be ended. It's a, it is a worst case scenario. It's clearly within the discretion of the council whether to do that or not, but it was just a suggestion based on the experiences of other Colorado communities and our one unfortunate experience here. And there's one other thing that this role change does, and that is it requires speakers to have original content if they're going to submit videos or presentations. They have to create it themselves. And that's because we have been dinged uh, by YouTube on copyrighted information already when people put uh, other folks' presentations in their uh, public comment. And if we get dinged uh, too often, we can't have our, our programs uh, um, censored, if you will, or taken off for a period of time. On Zoom, it comes off or something? YouTube. Oh, on YouTube, YouTube yeah. So we require original content if you're going to do a PowerPoint or a video and not using a third party's content. 
So again, it's members of the public sign up. They say whether or not they're a resident of Thornton. Um, you have to have original content if you're gonna have electronic uh, presentations and you need to be signed up as it's currently written at the time uh, remote comment begins if you're going to comment remotely. Did anyone, and you pass that as written on first reading. And so did anyone want to talk about council member Henson's issue of, or change that for second reading of not requiring folks to be signed up at the time remote public speaking begins? Anybody else on that issue Who wants to? Jessica? I mean, I understand what her issue is, but I think it's the bigger issue is what we made this for in the first place. So um, I'm fine with the way that we passed it the first time. Is there any objection to moving it forward for second reading? As is. Okay, right. thank you. That's that issue. Um, the second issue in the next slide, Adam, if you could, is Mayor Pro Tem Bigelow sent us a list of items that would be a good decorum for our audience. We have called that down to one page, and this is that page of uh, direction, if you will, for our audience. Uh, and if this is, I'm sorry, the mayor and the mayor of Motown, right, right. I'm sorry about that. And uh, so if this is acceptable as rules for our audience, we could begin posting these, um, you know, in the chambers or um, on the website, wherever is appropriate uh, for audience participation. And I won't read through those, but there they are. Roberta? How will people um, who do not put like where they're from be treated? <laughs> oh, on the previous question, you're changing your rules to require them to say. We're looking at the decorum, right? Yes. yes. It's just that Thornton residents will be given the right to speak first. Right, right. And I think it is a sign-in sheet where they just say, are you a Thornton resident? Yes, no. All the yeses go first. And anybody who's not what a resident. They don't mark it. They just leave it blank. Then I, I think the yeses go first. Okay. Those who declare they're a Thornton resident get to speak first. All right. Would we want to record that just to make sure that that occurs? Because I could see that being an issue. A sign-up sheet? It well, will a sign-up sheet, but also if they don't mark it, they'll be treated as, uh, maybe you could put that on there. Like if you don't mark it. They will questions. go after Thornton residents. Yes, we can put that on the sign-up sheet. So if they refuse to say where they're from, who they are, like they'll say who they are, maybe they'll make up a name, right? Right. And they refuse to say where they're from. Right. They would be treated as a non-resident. And we can also put it in the the, um, the mayor's script or the mayor pro tem mm -hmm. script, whoever's chairing the meeting that says uh, residents of Thornton will be heard first during public comment. Okay. But yes, we'll do it that way. Okay. Now you don't need to adopt these by resolution. Like I said, I think they're, you know, they're your intent for your audiences and we can start posting them if that's council's direction. So I did reach out to a couple other cities just to see what they're doing with this because this is becoming an issue across all over the place. And Commerce City actually requires them to give their full address and the clerk verifies it before they can speak. Mm -hmm. Now it's, I asked how their legal counsel agreed with that because what if somebody doesn't want to give their address and he goes, that's fine, but you have to go last. All right. So I don't know that we want to go that far where they have to give their address, but we know people will lie and say that they're a Thornton resident, even if they're not. Yeah. Well, this was kind of a compromised position. A lot of people don't want to give their address for various reasons. You know? It has a tendency to chill speech, especially if somebody's coming to council saying they have a problem with a nuisance in their neighborhood. They don't want to expose themselves. And again, the audience theoretically is worldwide based on the internet. And so I think there's some semblance of chilling speech. There are some cases from the East Coast that speak of this. They're not directly um, binding on us. And, and so we, we, we could do that. But I think generally, um, at least in the municipalities that I've looked at, both in Colorado and nationally, don't, don't push them. They ask, for example, in a previous jurisdiction I worked for, the, the script was something like, give us your address if you don't feel comfortable give it to the clerk directly, not announcing it. And then the clerk could just record that. Um, the problem with the verification is, you know, frankly, anybody who's not uh, a homeowner 
who went be listed like a renter, there would be no real way of confirming whether a renter was living in a certain location. So that's really kind of an empty promise. We really are relying both in this and in the previous um, slide, we're really asking for voluntary compliance and, and, and um, hoping that people are honest. Are there any objections to the list? Okay. Right, Let's start posting that. And so the final uh, issue under this uh, presentation is your code of conduct. So um, we in included in your packet on page 294, there is the question that we ask or asked each section and the responses that we received. So um, we received five folks who uh, gave comments on your code of conduct by section. Um, of those, um, a majority agreed with what was in the code of conduct now. Some suggested alternative language, and then some disagreed with certain provisions. There were, where there was at least one uh, vote in opposition of 12 different sections. And so I didn't know if council wants to go through each section, uh, maybe just the sections where there was disagreement or alternative language and go through that or how you want to proceed. Karen? Did you say that only five of the nine responded? Yeah, we had five responses. I don't think that we should go forward with it being the other four people's input. Well, I think the assumption when it went out was that if you did not respond, you were in agreement. We all are adults and we're able to respond. I don't either. I didn't respond. I just didn't really see it like, I mean, whatever, I'm fine with it. It's fine. I didn't have any comments for it. I didn't have any whatever. So you can add me to the, it really didn't make any difference. Did you share? Did you respond? Do we know that? No. I don't, I don't know that. I knew you did, Justin, because when you responded, sorry. <laughs> I was annoying about it. Yes. No, no, you weren't annoying. I mean, if we want to put it off for a couple more weeks to give people more time, but that assumption has to be made that if you do not respond, you agree. Yeah. Because we can't keep waiting. Or, Go ahead, or I, say, um, I don't know if I can go as far as if you do not respond, you, do, you agree. Well, like, if you don't respond, you don't get the same. Your time is up. I mean, we're not. Really not that it matters. It's just semantics, but um, uh, I I would be okay with letting people more time. But um, I don't know. we could also go urgency? through these items too, because I don't think there's much controversial. Yeah. I, uh, what's the urgency on? Um, it's your code of conduct. Yeah. 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 So we can take our time with it, or. On the look ahead, not knowing how um, very busy we are in the next few weeks, what would be a good time to bring it back for a discussion? There's only gonna be one planning session in June, which is June 4th, unfortunately. So that pushes you out to July. Do you wanna discuss that planning session? I think we'd need the time of a planning session to have a real discussion about it. Are we okay pushing it to July? Yeah, I think this is a, you brought it up, but again, this is an issue that doesn't have a real discrete deadline. So pushing it is not gonna I'd rather I wish I knew who didn't turn it in. So I, <laughs> I know who like, <laughs> so and maybe people are didn't are fine with that's why they didn't turn it in. Um, is council okay with, I, I don't know who didn't turn it in either. If anyone who didn't turn it in wants to come forward and say they're okay with it, we could continue that discussion as well. We don't have to do it again, do we? No. No. <laughs> we have the responses. Jessica? And also, just FYI, the um, CML came out with the civility article oh. with a civility pledge as a QR code. And so some of us have been just scanning the QR code and signing the pledge. So there's a lot of things going around right now that are all related to decorum, civility, and how we engage with each other. Could you send the pledge to us? Maybe we adopt that instead of... It's, I'm sorry, it's one more thing to look at. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
We can send that to you too. That's what I, I meant for her to send it to you all. Do you, have, do you have it, it right? Do you have it? Yeah, it's just yeah. in the article. The yeah, page. we have it. It might be because the, the, the responses that we have are 40 pages long with comments from Which each member. Really and so statistically, <laughs> we can go through each question. I mean, because we broke down the code of conduct by paragraph, I believe, to make it fit. It may be, it seemed like kind of a tedious process, but it's really your call. It's your potential code of conduct. Not you press your button, Jessica. I mean, I don't know if you want us to accept the changes or suggested language that was suggested in a red line and send it back out, or? Your... My suggestion is that we push it to July and or the net, whatever is, is available on our busy schedule. And that's it. You don't get it in by then, you don't get to say. You so I'll send out the survey one more time. That's my suggestion. I'm not going to fill it out again or at all. It's 40 <laughs> pages long for crying out loud. That's I don't want to fill that out. Just whatever you think is good, I'm good. Yeah. Well, maybe when you send out the survey, people who don't want to do all that can just check a box that says I'm not going to respond or something. <laughs> like, so you know they looked at it and that's it. Like they are coolio with everything, and we can just be on like it's on. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it means they agree with everything, but. We could say uh, they're not the assumption to... is if you do not fill this out, yeah. you agree. <laughs> Karen. Um if my my question is not about I, I find with what Justin suggested when we push it to uh July, I'd really like to see to see and know mm -hmm. information. And I think we need to combine. Um however, my question was on the um decorum. So if we put this in the consent calendar, no one said no. I mean, we talked about we're going to post it somewhere. You mean the audience decorum? Sorry, audience okay. Yeah. Because um, I don't think we were even going to vote on it because it's just, it's not a rule of order. Is that correct? Correct. It would just be posted. These so are we're just going to post it. Okay. These are already in the fact. Right. Gotcha. We're just putting them in one spot. Thank and, you. and we can update the script to clarify the sign up rules. And yes. Yeah. Okay. Jessica. And I think we talked about when you're reading the rules that it would come, it would show up on the screen while you were going so that there was a, I'm a visual person. And if you're just talking, I probably can't hear what you're saying. So if I can read it, that's helpful. And then you can just take it away later. Put the audience rules of decorum up as I'm giving the public comments overview you want them up the whole time while the public is talking or just when i give the i mean that i don't care but they should be up at some point on the big screen and then i'll need help from council to do points of order if needed if they're in violation because i can't call, all be on me so we're going to call point of order on the audience hey yeah, you can't do that <laughs> That's a good question. Tammy and I can work on details of what we do if they're- Yeah, I mean, you know, I can note that something violates your guidelines if you want me to, while the public comment is going on. I, you know. Yeah. We'll work through that. Sure. Okay. And then we're gonna push the rest of it until July. And also you'll resend the survey and then also the CML Civility yes. pledge. Civility. Because if, if it's a simple pledge, maybe that's all we need. It's literally a QR code and you read through it and then you sign it. It's not 40 pages. That's no, why you like it. It's a Google document. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item is an IGA for continued participation in the Home Investment Partnership Program Consortium. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Steinberg with um, the Grant and Housing Supervisor with Community Connections. And with me is Erica, and uh, as you both know. Um, and we are here to talk to you tonight about, let's see if I get the right button. 
the Adams County Home Investment Partnership Program Consortium. This is an intergovernmental agreement renewal for 2025 to 2027. Where do I direct this? This way. There. Okay. So our agenda today, we're just going to review briefly the home consortium. We're going to take a look uh, at the main pieces of parts of the IGA three-year renewal, look at our recommendation and the alternative, and then build any questions and get direction from council. So the city has been a member of the Adams County Home Consortium since 1986. Um, we are in this consortium with the county, Westminster, and Commerce City. The IGA, it allows these local governments to join together. Um, we need to be contiguous, and we can participate in the home program. Now, this program is designed, it's a HUD program. It's designed to increase supply of affordable housing, uh, provide rehabilitation to housing, uh, preservation of our housing stock and provide housing programs. And the third point is when the city is not in a consortium, then if we opted out, the funds would go to the state. They would just remain there and the state would have direction and authority over those. Example of our home funds include, where are you? <laughs> Um, and you'll notice in uh, your packet, there was a great spreadsheet describing what we've done over the past. Um, this just since 2001, but we've done home buyer assistance programs, partnering with CRHDC. We help fund with some of our home funds, the Crossing Point development, the 142 unit development on Crossing Point South. And you may remember that's for low to moderate income residents because home funds are directed at low to moderate income residents. And then I have a correction and I apologize. The last bullet point does not apply to home consortium. It should read that we for the last two years have not used the home funds and they have been rolled over. And that is in your council communication on the back page. Um, but the amount that we currently have in our coffers is $480,209. And we have not yet received our 2024 allocation. So um, moving faster than I thought. So Adams County is the lead agency of the home consortium. They have full responsibility of its administration, planning and reporting. Um, they receive funding applications annually, but they also can take them year round. So if a good project shows up and it's not in the March application date range, then we, they will entertain it. They'll take a look at it. Um, and then it is ultimately the, the Adams County that makes the decision to fund it or not. However, they do want the city to seek projects recommend projects if projects come to us or not recommend them um, so because that helps them make their decision. Um, Thornton projects then are to be reviewed by staff and council if necessary. Um, ultimately, it's uh, the county board and we can do it simply through a letter through the city manager or by resolution from council. So the renewal um, important things to know about the renewals. Once we're in for three years, we're in for three years. We can't opt out. Um, and Adams County, um, with every member's approval, can add additional communities to the consortium. However, they need to be CDBG eligible and part of the program. And Brighton and North Glen, for example, are just not big enough yet. So we won't see any real changes coming up in the next three years. Um, and every, everybody has to sign and agree. Um, so now we're down to basic, um, our recommendation to switch. Mm -hmm. 
is to continue to participate in the home consortium for the years 25, 26, and 27. The alternative, of course, is to not receive those funds and opt out for three years, um, where we could be uh, invited to, you know, to rejoin in three years' time. So any questions on Chris. the home consortium? Um, I'm bored in the participation. I'm just curious when you look at the chart that you held up, um, mm -hmm. what was the significant gains after 2021 where we started banking the funds instead of expediting for rental assistance down payment? I mean, are we, or is there something particular that we're trying to save some money up for to do something big? Yes, it's a definite possibility because we've been entertaining some folks, uh, different developers have come in and, and gone away. But yeah, the thought is a bigger fund can do more for a big impact on affordable housing. But we also just didn't get any applications that actually went all the way through to the county. So we've waited. Justin? And I can answer that because there are projects that will come now that we have the water. And so I don't think we're going to have any rollover funds. There's already targeted spots for that. And they just didn't want to move forward with it until there was certainty. So that money doesn't go away. We get to use. Correct. I would always support this. I would never want to send our money back to the state. They, they will never do anything for us. Any objection to the recommendation? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. The next item is a Public Arts Center interest survey. <laughs> Um, evening council, uh, we're, uh, back, uh, two weeks ago, we presented, um, a couple of options for a survey, uh, option a included was a longer survey included kind of a broader parks and rec feel before it dialed into, uh, questions about performing arts and option B was focused on performing arts. Uh, your direction two weeks ago was go with option a, the broader survey. However, you had some um, discussion around whether or not we should include, a tax question on there and so the direction that we heard out of that meeting was uh not sure about the tax question but can you bring us back some different options for questions for us to consider that try to address the cost or or demand what we're willing to, willingness to pay i think was a phrase um and so that's what we're here to talk about and i'm going to turn it over to john all right uh good evening council john whining senior manager panels city manager's office uh, with me is brian murray and or Jason Morado of ETC Institute uh, with us virtually. Ryan, Jason, can you guys hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Thanks, John. Can we turn them up? All right, thanks, Brian. Um, I can't hear them, but it's just deaf. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I'll be briefing the presentation. Uh, Ryan's just on in case you all have any technical questions about the survey, uh, methodology distribution, that kind of stuff. Uh, so we're here tonight to finalize Performing Arts Center survey so we can get it out the door and start hitting Thornton mailboxes uh, next month. Um, looking at the agenda, first I'll <clears throat> really quickly go over the background, which is mostly what Rob just said, uh, providing the direction that you all gave us at the uh, previous planning session. Uh, we'll then go, uh, we'll then cover the requested changes that you all made to the survey. Uh, we'll talk about what we've done to those changes. We'll then move the discussion into the uh, uh, those cost questions that Rob referenced, um, you asked us to to, to develop, uh, and then we'll conclude the uh, discussion with a high level summary uh, of the schedule of the survey process. So when it gets finalized, when it should hit mailboxes, and when will the results be presented to you all? Um, so as Rob mentioned at the uh, last planning session, you gave us direction to move forward, um, but requested that we provide you with alternative cost questions. Uh, in replacement of that standalone uh, tax question uh, of your consideration. Uh, so for tonight, we'll have uh, three cost questions for you to review. Uh, so at the previous planning uh, session, uh, there was a number of changes in addition to those uh, cost questions you asked for. Uh, the first one was to include school venues as options for the what venues have you visited question uh, that is included uh, on the uh, survey. It's, it's question 11A. Uh, it's a slight typo. Some of those are double counted, but they're all there and we'll get it cleaned up before it uh, gets finalized. 
Uh, the second request was uh, to add art instruction and singing dancing instruction as options to the what would you like to see in a performing arts center question. Uh, that's now included on question 13. Uh, there's also a request to include a bit of a preamble uh, before the demographic demographic questions, uh, asking uh, just letting uh, individuals know that these are purely optional. They don't have to uh, participate in them. Uh, we did include that. It's uh, directly after question 20. And then uh, number four was to remove that standalone tax question that's gone. And then the final request was to uh, add other cost questions for council consideration. And I will uh, go right into that. So we have three different types of cost questions uh, for you all to review tonight. Um, if it works for you all to help with this discussion, I'm just going to quickly go through all three of them. So you have all the information and I'll circle back to this, this first one here. Uh, so the, the first potential cost question, it's a uh, question 14 in the packet. Uh, it's basically an, an amenities uh, preference question. It's asking survey respondents to identify the top three things they would like to see in a Thornton Performing Arts Center. Uh, the potential cost question number two, it's question uh, 19 in the packet. Uh, it's a funding question. This was a request from council to have a, a question like this. Basically, it provides respondents with three types of funding options uh, to pay for a Performing Arts Center, which the three are go it alone, have some sort of public-private partnership, or do a sales tax initiative. Uh, we really tried in, in the language for each of these questions to depict what each option would really mean for the city. So identify some of those drawbacks each one of those options would have if selected. And then the uh, final cost question for your consideration tonight. Um, this is a, another council requested question. This is like a, a ticket cost question. This is a how much would you pay at the door kind of question. Um, so our staff provided us some general examples what kind of shows uh, would be associated with the different ticket amounts uh, that are uh, on the screen in front of you. So I'll go back to that first one. So uh, three cost questions. We had the first one, the amenities preference question. Then we had those three different types of funding questions. Then we had the cost of a ticket at the door question. Um, so if you all have any comments or questions for us on these, on these options we provided, we're happy to help you answer those. Um, we're really just here looking for direction on, on which of any of these questions uh, you want us to include in the survey. Can we ask all three? Yeah, sure. Your survey. <laughs> That's good. I like, I like the first and the third the most. I mean, the second one is good, but I, I don't know. It's just a lot looking at it. The third one is nice because it kind of gives you an idea of what kind of facility they're thinking of without saying. And the first one gives you more specific programming, I guess. Justin? Um, yeah, I, I, my favorite one is the third one. That was really what I was getting at with the trying to get an idea of willingness to pay. Um, and then uh, maybe, yeah, could you go to the third one? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I think actually, yeah, that, that's, that's great. And then I like the first one quite a bit too. Um, so those, those would be the ones. The second one, do you go with the second ones? Um, the second one is, is okay, I guess, but it's still kind of limiting that one. Yeah, I was thinking it's basically take away, take away that whole, uh, Pragmatic, how we do this, and focus more on how what do you value. And mm -hmm. this is more second question speaks to how do you think we should do it, which to me is kind of a different direction of the rest of the survey. And I think if we include in questions one and three, it'd be a really great survey. My my question is to the staff is would this survey um, and all the um, you know, anonymous responses be made available to researchers if they ask the city? Or was that something that made sense? You're talking about somebody, if a third party wanted access to our data? Yeah. Sure, my attorney was here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, you think survey results, I'm pretty on the spot. You think survey results are subject to Quora? Mm, potentially, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Okay. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure how you think you would protect them. I mean, 
if it's work product of city council and we want to use those in the course of their decision making there's a potential for a confidentiality there but we'd really have to design it in that manner and protect it well i'm thinking the opposite i would like that because i i think if we make this survey we put those one questions one and three on there you're going to get a bunch of economists from all around the country using the survey to write research papers on uh on uh public you know, in the field of public economics, I think it's really cool. Um, so those are my comments. So the proposal is one in three. Is there any objection to one in three? So that would be leaving out 19 altogether? Uh -huh. Okay. I'm assuming, and I, I wasn't here for the first discussion on this, but I'm, <laughs> I'm assuming the question that was really just seeking you know, how we want to fund it and the rest of the general public. So, I mean, does that take away from you know, I see in all the other questions of what they're interested in? We spend it back to money. Does that start to skew people's thought process of like, this would have been cool, but we don't want to focus on the dollars and cents now. Maybe if we see a great interest in all of the other answers, then this should be a question later on that gets asked. And, you know, maybe, I don't think it'd be another survey, but let's focus on the content more than the price tag now and if people aren't interested then this question never even comes up honestly yeah i think from our standpoint we're fine if this one is in there we really struggled with it because it was um it got into kind of the i think somebody said the how and and we're not there yet and to be honest like to ask the public that with this limited information like we tried to put some contextual uh information in there in these three options and, and i look at it, i just think it's kind of it's not really all that useful of a question um, I think what we were trying to do is trying to be responsive to some of the discussion two weeks ago about, you know, there was, there was, there was uh, some level of disagreement on whether we should include the tax or not include the tax. Um, but then in that discussion, it was like, well, we should talk about some of these other financial options. We shouldn't talk just about a tax. And so I think that's why this question found its way on this draft. But when we, when we went over it, I, I mean, John and I really struggled with this language and, um, because it just feels a little out of place at this point and and really not providing that great of information for us because you ask the average person these things that I just don't think the information is going to be helpful good to be honest with you for my personal opinion. Agreed. Roberta? Well, I think it's valuable work, so maybe save it for later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just think like when you look at like, I know you all did another survey, like didn't you do one last year? Were you working on one? We presented the results of the survey last year. Yeah. Community wide so, survey. I feel like I don't know if we were to ever do that again or something like that. That would be valuable just to see where people would lie on funding. But I I like the point that Justin made about like it being more about how it provides value to the community right now as opposed to like how we fund it at this moment, just to see if it's something that's a desire. For the community, so I, I would think like just maybe table it for a while. Sure. I hate to see all your work on that <laughs> go unused. <laughs> It'll be saved. <laughs> they are. We're probably like three iterations of this question saved somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I think we have consensus to add one and three, and leave out two. Right. I'm really glad to see the school part added too, because that's a lot of the feedback I've been getting is that the schools actually want to partner with us a little bit more than we have to use their space. Like all three, four of our school districts actually want to, us to start using their space more. I don't know how that would work or how we would do it, but if there's a lot of interest in programming, that might open the door for some opportunities. And I know Adams County was telling me that they are looking at adding an event center to the fairgrounds that would seat 4,000 people. So that might be putting themselves in direct competition to anything we might be trying to do as well. So programming to me seems like a really good use of this survey. So are we trying to protect the survey results until a decision is made? No, we're not. No, Justin's okay. su suggestion was that we let it be open so that people could use it to bring things right. into the city. Okay, understood. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Council. Uh, next steps, uh, these surveys should start hitting mailboxes next month, and then uh, ETC and staff will provide you the results by uh, late July or early August. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item is the SBC. <laughs> Um, 
actually, uh, two weeks ago, uh, we talked about this as well. Um, uh, we were actually uh, right off the heels of the SPC and um, we talked about kind of two different um, uh, two different efforts. One is to continue the work on the uh, uh, mission vision values, the, the stuff that Jerry helped us with and we are trying to coordinate some data that'll work. Um, and then the other path is what we're here to talk about tonight, which is uh, identifying um, budget priorities uh, for council and having that discussion early and uh, throughout the budget process. So um, tonight we're here, to as the as the purpose says, we're here to review the initial list of 2025 budget priorities as identified by you all um, and discuss the next steps. So thank you for uh, everybody that submitted um, your submittals. As, as you see in the, we sent out an updated packet this morning. I'm not sure you had a chance to see it, but we'll uh, go through it here tonight. We have basically 27-ish priorities. There was some overlap um, from you all. And, and so we tried to kind of combine things that we thought were the same. Um, and so I'll just I'll just briefly cover those. I don't I don't want to go into great detail about them um, because we'll have a different an opportunity to do that later. Um, and then like I said, just talk about next steps. So uh God, it's, it's smaller on this screen. Um so you, you can kind of see, I, I organized it around the what, which is generally, those should look familiar to you. And what I tried to do, um, and I appreciate everybody who provided the, what you pretty much all did, provide kind of some context behind what you identified. But what I was trying to get at is the why. You know, why is this important? Um, what's the desired outcome? What's the what's the the goal that we're trying to achieve? Or what, what does success look like? Um, for each one of these things, because I think it's really important that we not just focus on a solution or something that we want to fund, but really have a, gra a grasp and an understanding of, you know, what the problem is, defining what the issue is, um, so that we can make sure that we've, uh, we've identified the best solution for it. So um, these are in al uh, alphabetical order, not in any sort of priority order, but um, you can read down the list here. Um, and then uh, there's the rest of them. Uh, so like I said, 27 uh, of these items. Uh, if you if you don't see uh, if you think one's missing, please let me know. But I, th I think I captured everything. Um, so uh, what I wanted to talk about, and I can go back to these if you have questions. Uh, you know, well, we're we're not trying to prioritize these tonight. Um, what based on uh, the agenda tonight, we think it's probably best that you do that offline. Um, so what I would suggest that at, at this point um, tomorrow, I can send you all a quick poll, and you can identify you know, your top five uh, items. And then the the um, the, uh, the summation of that will identify kind of the order that we talk about these things. So you're not you're not deciding what you're gonna fund, or you're not you know voting on anything. It's really just deciding what's where, where's the most energy, what topics of these have the have the most energy for for you all as a group. Um, and then we would begin the review of those items at uh, in in two weeks at a planning session. The idea with the review, um, depending on what you identify, but it would likely involve some initial kind of staff briefing to talk a little bit about um, about the like. Let's just use a hypothetical code compliance. Code compliance was uh, one of the items that a number of you identified as a priority. Um, what it likely provide is a, just a brief background of what our current levels of service is, how we're staffed, how we're resourced. Kind of just talk about hey, how this is how it's done right now. Uh, maybe talk a little bit about some of the challenges or things that staff are thinking about, but then have a have a discussion with you all about okay. Um, now that I, I kind of have a general understanding of um, of how this is working, what what are um, what are is council seen as the priority? And again, going back to that why or the outcome, what are we trying to accomplish here? Maybe uh, maybe re more resources, maybe more staffing is is uh, required, but let's first talk about somebody really smart once said that you know, if I had an hour to solve a problem, I'd spend fifty five minutes you know, defining the problem before I go to the solutions. Let's make sure we have an understanding, at least from us, from a staff standpoint, of what success looks like for you all in each one of these areas um, before we talk about the solution. So at the at those sessions, um, what I'm imagining is we would just roll through the, the, the items in their priority order. Um, we kind of have, a, like I said, a brief, not a long drawn out staff report, but a, a, a brief review of our current level of service and some discussion about council, uh, from council about what the priority is and what the issue is. Um, and so that we can take that and then integrate it into the budget recommendation. So again, starting on 6-4 and however long it takes to work through the priority items, but we wouldn't be, what we're not looking for is necessarily a direction or a decision. What we're looking for is some discussion and feedback so that um, so the staff and, and Brett can come back and um, integrate that feedback into the budget recommendation. And that initial recommendation 
is coming in August. And that's not, as you've heard Erica talk about with the new process, um, that's not when you vote, that's that's like an initial discussion. So there's times after that to kind of say, yeah, did we get it right? No, we need to tweak around the edges a little bit or whatever. So that's what we're proposing um, to review. The, the immediate ask would be um, tomorrow, I'd send out an email and, and try to get you all to identify your priorities. And then we'd be back in two weeks to talk about those things that are highest up on your list. So at that point, I'd be happy to answer any questions about our proposed process or um, any of these items that are on the list. And again, if you if you didn't see one of yours, let me know. I'm pretty sure I got all of them, but I don't want to exclude any, anybody. Any questions? Jessica? So when we talked with um, Jerry at the SPC, he talked about that paired What's that thing called? Paired comparison, yeah. I, I really want to go through that. You want to try that? Especially okay. for this with 27. And maybe yeah. there's no time between now and whatever you said, but I think it would be really helpful. I think there's a way. Um, so I'm familiar with it. And and Jerry, thankfully, sent me some of the, the information. He actually has a pretty neat tool that you can use. I think that um, maybe as a next step after we have some discussion about the initial, you know, when you, once there's like a bit of, robust discussion about it, that would be an appropriate time to maybe, you know, again, just to, it's a different tool to kind of identify where the energy is around these ideas. And so using that as a, as a tool to kind of prioritize um, um, some of these items, the items that you're honing in on, I think is is something that we could certainly do. I think we're just looking for ways to help us prioritize. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's really what it is. It's just a tool. And the neat thing about it is it kind of it, it's it's not quite like a March Madness bracket, but it, it kind of is because you got to, it for, I think Jerry said this, you got to pick, you know, and and I think that's the hard part about this is there's all all the ideas are good. The hard part is deciding which good ideas to kind of pick on the other one. So uh, I thought it was kind of a neat tool to do that. So if it, if it works out something you have interest in, I think it's something we can do. I would suggest that we do it after we have some initial discussion about some of these items. On, on that note, then I guess it's because we're doing this so differently this year, I, I'm i not clear on, so we do the survey or whatever it is that we're gonna mm -hmm. narrow it down to our top five. I didn't really see anything in that 27 that was a big capital project. How is that gonna factor in? I mean, there are some, a couple, I guess, but nothing kind of what we've seen in years past how will that factor in? Because usually at the SPC, we kind of had a, here's how much money we have. If you want to do X, Y, and Z, if you don't want to do Z, then there's more money over here for these. I mean, I, we don't have any of that information. Um, I'm not sure I, I fully understand your question. Uh, are you are you talking specifically about what unfunded, are you asking for information about what unfunded capital projects are out there? No, I'm just saying in general, in the years past at the SPC, we kind of had that information at that point. And so when we actually got to the budget discussion, we knew there was consensus around a capital project. And so that money was sort of already off the table. Okay. Or, you know, we, we put money to that. These are not, this list doesn't look like that. No. And so is there at the presentation going to be, you know, this is how much money we think we're going to have. This is, I don't, I guess I'm not sure what to expect going into this. Yeah. Um, well, a couple things. things. Uh, likely on, I think on the 25th is when we're bringing back the initial quest of June. So on the, on the, yeah, yeah. On the 25th of June, you'll at least see kind of, isn't that the primary though? Are we having a council meeting that day? The 25th of June? Yeah. It's a primary day? <clears throat> primary that day. Colorado primary, right? Okay. June 25th. No. Yeah, June 25th. Really? Primary doesn't matter. Some people at night meeting. <laughs> Which for somebody it might. <laughs> I don't know. We've never had them on the primary. We've always. Yeah, been. that's why I was. Uh, you kind of caught me deer in headlights because we always avoid the primary days. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, I always associate them with March. There's a different one. And sorry, I don't follow the elections that closely. But what's that? Bonus primary. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I'm honestly a finger. So the 25th. 
if we're here, we're determined. We'll just see. Yeah, we, we if, if we're, we do have a meeting scheduled on the 25th, if we're not going to meet, we can do it some other time. The, the point I was going to make is, is when we bring back that initial recommendation, we'll give you the financial projections, kind of show where we are. However, what we were not planning on doing, I'll need to talk to Brett about, is having a big briefing about all of our unfunded capital projects. Um, and so at this point, we were waiting to see what you all identified as priorities um, and uh, absent thinking about it until just now, all we were really going to do is bring back a recommendation on here's the funded projects, here's the unfunded projects, which you hear on the 25th or whenever that meeting is. And I don't want to hear about the unfunded capital, especially if we didn't identify those. Okay. I'm just saying normally we kind of know how much money we have to deal with. So and there, there's not... We don't. There's not a substantial amount of excess fund balance that we necessarily have to play with that we could put towards some of these other capital projects. So unfortunately, it's not. Yeah, there's been times where there's been extra fund balance that we could play with and put some big money towards things. And we just we don't have that right now. In fact, there's a lot of discussions that we've been having internally with the department heads looking at. Um, you may have heard me say this already, but can we reduce levels of service in one area to try to enhance it in another and, and have those types of conversations? Because there just isn't a lot of new funding coming in that we could commit to some big capital uh, projects or other resources. That being said, we are going to be proposing some things through the budget process. And yes, there's there's not, uh, let's say, like big fire stations or other things on this list that we want to try to tackle, but um, they could still sub be subject to the conversation. And that's the other thing I wanted to point out. Yeah, we're trying to like, the two pieces Rob mentioned emphasize is we want to start to hone around what types of discussions you want to have, but then we also want to make sure that you're getting the background information on it, kind of what we call the levels of service. So you have that kind of core understanding of what we were already doing and how we might be able to enhance it and what that outcome looks like too. So we'll be going through that exercise, but if something comes up later in this process that we really find is a priority, it doesn't mean that we can't talk about it either, um, or, but we are trying to get ahead of it, certainly by doing it in this fashion. Does that make sense? And, yeah, that helps. It's just different process this year, so. Yeah, it helps. true. Chris? That was my specific question. The comment earlier is I want to know what the unfunded capital projects or what you guys had in mind being is that when you found some members here, you can check it up and know that information would be helpful. But there's no monitoring. If there's a conversation we have, I would like to know that information. Oh, we have giant lists of unfunded projects. That we <laughs> there's always something ready. <laughs> What helps though is like even in that list of 27 or whatever it was on this, it starts to, you start to see themes and okay, there's certain unfunded projects that might fit into some of these themes too that we, we know that we might need to pay more consideration to through this process. Any questions, concerns with this approach? So you see an email from me tomorrow. Um, and if so you don't answer it, then you agree with the majority. <laughs> <laughs> don't send for right, it or just give your proxy to justin <laughs> it'll be it'll be a simple google form it'll be, it will be much easier than whatever tammy did <laughs> it wasn't hard <laughs> thank you very much and thank you for your um for your responses uh and and um, your thoughtful commentary is really helpful for us to get uh, get a sense of what you're all thinking all right any board or commission updates to speak Justin? Also, Todd met uh, last, last Wednesday. Um, I think the most um, important thing to know from that was that we did hear uh, about a presentation from RTD regarding the, um, I think it's SB 230 bill that was passed um, about the funding from the oil and gas production fees. It would go specifically into the north of the end line corridor as well as the uh, northwest corridor, which they can use the language from the fast tracks ballot. And so we asked some questions and we did get some clarification. Um, so it's important to note that Dr. Cog does have a, um, a vote, or uh, the Dr. Cog board of directors does get to decide ultimately what, um, like where those project money is being funded. So it's not uh, entirely out of the hands of representatives from our, our area. So we think that Dr. Cogbo is very important and that they RTD did say that although those corridors are mentioned by their legal name or whatever they were called in fast tracks, that 
the intention is that that money will be spent on the actual rail lines themselves. And so in order to prevent any kind of, uh, you know, issues that Councilmember St. Angren was concerned about, I think some of us are all are concerned about them. And Dr. Cobb will have a final say on how that gets spent. So it is important that um, not just us as Thornton um, advocate for, you know, on Dr. Cobb, but we also talk to our fellow council members who are on that board from the North Metro area. And also uh, NADA will probably also be um, very helpful on that since there's a big overlap between the two. And so I think that's generally good news. Um, it doesn't completely alleviate those concerns, but it does uh, give me some assurance that we do have a voice in determining how that money from SB 230 will ultimately be spent, which we want to be spent on completing the <laughs> one line in particular. Um, and then it also does, talks about the, the B line, but that's not as important to board. Mm -hmm. That's my update. Any other updates? So Rocky Flats, we didn't meet. We haven't met yet. I mean, I think that this is probably referring to the executive committee meeting and all we do there is set the agenda so that we probably can take those updates off when we have those meetings. Um, the Mile High Flood District board meeting, the May meeting is actually a tour. So there is not a meeting there. So nothing to report there. All right, uh, council discussion items. Jessica. All right, I have one question about the build a block. Where are we with that? The about better block? That better block, yeah. yeah. So we are in the planning process for uh, that event, and you're going to see some information coming out about that pretty soon. Uh, that is for uh, East Lake area um, to kind of generate some energy and excitement around that area, and, and there's a lot of community engagement component to it as well for an event in the fall of this year. So you're going to start to see some more information coming out about that. Uh, in the coming weeks. So we are working with them. We are finalizing the agreement with them now. So. Perfect. Thank you. And then I wanted to let the council know and um, thank the fire department uh, and Doug, uh, the uh, first, what was it, the Red Cross partnered with the fire department and um, the Rotary Club. And so this past weekend, they had their International Day of Service and um, fire department, Rotary Club, and Red Cross went out was it 30 homes, I think, mostly mobile homes, and installed smoke detectors. I think they installed over 80 smoke detectors. I heard from one of the groups today that every house that they went to, none of them had a working smoke detector in their home. And so it sounds like there's more um, of those activities coming. And so that was a direct service right back to uh, Thornton residents, which I thought was really very cool to hear about. Um, so thanks for helping to set that up. Roberta? I was just wondering if we heard anything about the scooter program. Scooters. Um, <laughs> we're checking with some of the other vendors. Uh -huh. uh, the one we had last year did not renew with us. Heard. So we're hopeful that we can find another vendor that will participate, but we haven't yet. Chris? The theories of uh, Chief Kelly, if you wouldn't mind uh, just doing a quick summary of uh, meeting today and what we've been working on. Um, and then Adam St. Chair, Chief Claps, just to maybe catch up some of the other. I've, I've talked about it briefly with you, but probably you can articulate it better. I think it's yeah, perhaps uh, worthwhile information. Yeah. Uh, so, Thornton, for probably about 40 years, uh, the city of Thornton has been a part of the Adams, Adams Jefferson County uh, Housing Response Authority. Over the past year, uh, we've been working to dissolve that authority for a variety of reasons to better serve hazmat response here in Adams County. And that's been an ongoing process. Um, there's a number of steps that would need to be taken to do that with some division of assets between the two counties. Uh, but ultimately, at the end, what we're going to have is a really a better, a better hazmat response, both for here in the city and in the region. Uh, have to answer any other questions you have. That's sort of the gist of what's coming from in that without authority. Is that the E470? Do you, is that where you're going that way with hazmat or what's no so our, our hazmat response team for Adams County as a whole, uh, not just E470. And so essentially the with the split between the two, 
we'll establish our own response teams, equipment, trainings, et cetera, uh, particularly to that extent. We'll always help out our neighbors, um, but the main focus is the split of those two, and then the creation of just Adams County solo as a response. And that, I mean, we're a very large town, but um, I don't know, we're not gonna take much of our resource needs or- it, It's not, what it's gonna be is a more effective deployment of existing resources that are more focused specifically here in Adams County and not being distributed over a larger geographic area. So the, the Adams DEFCO Hazmat Hazardous Response Authority um, really had an initial purpose going back decades that has been evolving. And the funding that was available for that combined authority has been less effective over time to serve the greater region. And so by moving the direction that we're recommending as, as Adams County, uh, the intent is that we can continue to provide a high level of service, do it more effectively, more, more efficiently. And that services across highways, rail lines, um, you know, the manufacturing things that we have here in the city, it's, it's pretty broad. Well, more to come, but this has been the, the direction that we've been going. Thank you. Anything else from council? I feel like bad. It's 845. Y'all have a nice Get evening. Get out now while you can. <laughs> You had the three executive sessions. Though. Oh, crap. That, why is that not popping up on my agenda? <laughs> Dang it. You're right. It didn't pop up on my agenda. A lot of them get to leave. They get to leave. All right. Uh, oh, I will go ahead and call to order a special meeting. Can I please get a roll call of the council? Mayor Coleman? Here. Councilmember Acundo? Here. Councilmember Aya? Here. Councilmember Bigelow? Here. 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 Councilmember Henson. Councilmember Martinez. Here. Councilmember Russell. Here. Councilmember Sanford. Here. Councilmember Don Ryan's here. He can't participate in the executive session. So he can say here, but he'll have to leave and not actually be in it. Okay, good night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before I ask for a motion to enter executive session, can we please get an overview of the three sessions that we're going to have tonight? Yes, and then if we could do three individual motions. I will say the first two executive sessions will not take too long, uh, if that gives everyone hope. So the first executive session, uh, we were asked to look at whether or not uh, we could enter into an agreement like we have entered into with Ting uh, with Google. And I wanted to have an executive session just to... Uh, convey to council the legal research I have done on that issue. And so if council would like to enter into that executive session, it would be a motion to go into executive session pursuant to CRS 2464024B to confer with the city attorney to receive legal advice regarding broadband internet services in the city and the city's agreement with Ting to provide such services. Any questions on that one? Motion as stated. Pardon me? Make a motion as stated. Mm -hmm. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor, please say yes. Yeah. Yes. Any opposed, please say no. I think Councilmember Sangren, I think, went to the restroom, but she is not voting on this one, but she will be back for the session. Um, next item. Yes. The next item is an executive session uh, to discuss the 1988 Intergovernmental Agreement on, uh, on a new airport and to determine matters relative to uh, that may be relevant relative to negotiations and uh, to receive legal advice regarding same. Um, and this exact session will be led by uh, Jessica. Uh, Jessica, did you want to add anything to that? She stepped out. There are questions on that. I believe this has to do with legal counsel associated with noise uh, suits. Any questions on that one? With no questions, the motion would be an executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statutes 2464024B and E1 to receive legal advice regarding ongoing legal disputes relative to aircraft noise violation provisions containing in the contained in the 1988 Intergovernmental Agreement on New Airport and to determine positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations and instructing negotiators regarding the same. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Thank you, motion has been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please say yes. 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 Any opposed, please say no. 
All right, and the third item. Yeah, the third item is uh, to discuss uh, security arrangements uh, or investigations. It's a presentation from the police department. The Colorado Open Meetings Law specifically allows security arrangements to be discussed in executive session. If council would like to go into executive session, the motion would be to go into executive session pursuant to Colorado Revised Statutes 246402-4D, specialized details of security arrangements or investigations regarding council security training. Any questions? Can I get a motion as stated? Motion as stated. And a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say yes. 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 Any opposed, please say no. All right, we will take a moment to turn off the recording, switch it over and move into formal executive session.